Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, Night and Refuge. Thank you for joining us. It's been very special to be organizing this event, sharing one's writing practice through one poem, sharing one's thought as writers through one poem is really the idea tonight. Following ancient traditions of collaborative poets writing and notably perhaps because it also built itself around the question of seasons and the question of times uh, the the old form of Japanese collaborative form called renga or linked verse I've kept the rules very open very simple and I'll go through them later on I will also introduce you to the wonderful uh, poets that have joined me here but I just wanted to perhaps um, introduce the, the cycle of work that has led me here. This idea of working with night, for me, concludes a long cycle of performances and poetic events that have involved a great number of poets, translators, and collaborators, also musicians, still going on through this event and on into the following event that this poem we're developing to today will be linked to, so continuing this idea of relays of works. It started with an outdoor sunrise performance. It continued with afternoon or evening discussions that transformed into sound works that engage with migratory bird recorded, recordings recorded locally. And now we're entering the night. And we're entering the night at this time of our global confinement. So what does it mean? And what will it bring? And in this context, what does refuge mean? Poetically, how would one address the question of refuge and practically, politically? This idea of sharing online sets up its own parameters, of course. So I've asked each of the poets that are joining me here tonight to open up their process, to open up the way they are addressing the tasks, if you like, the rules that we are setting up here so that they come in to play with you. And we have a hashtag called Night and Refuge, hashtag Night and Refuge, which I'll remind you of several times during the few hours we are together, where you can feed your comments. And some of you might also wish to engage with some of the work that we're doing by putting down some questions. If there's time, if we can, we will, they will be feeded back to us and we will do our best, uh, but also perhaps poetic lines or thoughts on the project, all this will be archived and kept. We will close the event with a short reading of the poem by the five poets. I want to thank the wonderful organizations and friends who are supporting and hosting this event through which we grow together. Cement Field, they are our main partners and are gonna be hosting part of this event as part of the Estuary Festival in 2021, we hope. Also, Counterpoint Arts and the Festival of Hope that are co-hosting this event through Vesopolis now. Festival of Hope is a pan-European organization dedicated to the sharing of poetry across European territories. Thank you all for being partners and supporters and for hosting our attempt at writing, sharing. I also want to acknowledge the support of the Institute of English Studies in London and the Arts Council, England. And I want to thank the team of Sonic Atlas, this ongoing cycle of mine. They are in the background, they facilitated the work and the fact that we are here today, they worked very hard to get the event known and try and provide you with the most stable image and sound tonight. Before I introduce you to the five poets, I wanted to read, um, a small quote by the wonderful Moroccan poet, novelist, philosopher, Abdel Kebir Kadibi. He wrote very beautifully. He worked a lot on bilingualism, bilingual poetics, friendships, dialogues. And here, these are a few wonderful pages on what he calls variations on friendship. These are very quickly translated by me just to give you a sense of flavor of, this, um, of this beautiful, these beautiful thoughts. Friendship partakes of invention of dialogue and in the play between being a virtue and provide a dangerous truth. 
In this sense, we easily conceive that it is a condition of the social bonds of both private and public opinion, of communal spirit, whether it is political, intellectual, or spiritual. Friendship then is part of civilization's work and it is one of founding paradigms of thoughts and of the exercise of democracy and justice. Friendship then is understood here as providing access to a promise, often elusive, yet a possible promise and a sign of alliance, but an alliance with whom and with what? with the gods, with other humans, with other beings, with the things of existence? And what is the secret truth on the seriousness of life, of illness, of death, of survival that it provides? For me, this event is very much under the sign of friendship and poetry as acts of friendship. So let me now introduce to you the five poets that have welcomed and accepted my invitation to take us through the night with their work. I will let you, I will let them introduce themselves and I will start with uh, Will Harris. Would you like to literally introduce yourself briefly and as you wish to our viewers? Hi, uh, I'm Will. I am very glad to be here to kind of write, write our way through the night, through the stages of the night, just as it's getting a little bit duskier in, uh, in London, which is where I am. I know we're all kind of scattered around the world. It's been the hottest May on record here. Maybe it's useful to know that. <laughs> or the hottest day in May for years. Um, yeah, and this is the first time I've exposed my, my practice such as it is to other people and to the public in this way so I'm quite quite nervous but excited thank you will thank you and you can of course check uh, all these posts wonderful works online and through their works i'm sure you know their works already and now we have leo boys hi hello hi. um i'm here in deal in kent um very near the sea um, it's a lovely day. Um, well, this is, uh, as Will was saying, is um, the same. I'm, this is the first time I'm doing uh, this kind of collaboration and I'm really excited. Um, I'm bilingual. I write both in Spanish and English, but I've been writing in English for the last um, six, six, seven years. And before it was just only in Spanish. Um, but because I live here in the UK, um, I'm writing more and more in English using Spanish words. And um, so this will be a great space to, um, to explore those things. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Nisha. Hi, I'm Nisha. I am talking to you from Southeast London. Uh, it's extremely warm. Um, and bright and I yeah like Will I have never done something like this before and feel nervous. I love talking about and thinking about improvisation in other people's work but never actually doing it myself so this is I'm really glad for the chance to actually try out try to put some of these things into into practice so um yeah and I love all the poets involved and I'm very excited to read what they're writing and to talk to them um, yeah Wonderful. thank you Nisha thank you and Vani Kapildev Nisha Ramaya sorry I forgot to say your last name and then Vani please are you are you around Hey, my name is Vani Kapildeo. I'm a writer in residence at the University of York and a Seamus Heaney Center Poetry Fellow at Queen University of Belfast. Uh, currently in Port of Spain, about 10 and a half degrees north of the equator, using very bad computer equipment. <laughs> and you are with us, which is great. Thank you, Vani. Thank you. Um, so that's brilliant. So now I think we are ready to go. 
Um, this is, um, let me just take you through then. The poem is separated, as you can see on this writing desk. The writing desk has been developed with visual artist Mace Albaik, and she's at the back, sort of, she's gonna be scrolling and making sure the machine, the page, digital page keeps on working smoothly. As you can see, we've organized the poem in five different sections, and it's gonna be a very quick sort of a zooming, in fact, a zooming through, a zapping through the night here. Uh, since in two and a half hours, we're going to be trying to go through what I think at the moment is about 10 hours of the twilights. So we're starting with the, the, so the twilights are the different types, if you like, of dusk that precede, that come from this, that precede uh, the falling of the night. And then we move into, through the night and back into the rotation that then leads to this, which is really the deep night, because at the moment it is at uh, the astronomical dawn or the astronomical twilight at the moment is at, is at uh, 2 a.m. Um, in, um, in Britain. Um, so it is pretty dark still and it leads towards the dawn. So it's just all these points of transition and threshold and, and changes in the quality of sight and of the night that is of interest here. Also perfect, of course, that there, we are choosing the structure because it allows the five of us to be functioning across those different five uh, if you like, progressive moments of the darkening. Each poet is going to be opening a, a, uh, one, of the, one, of the, um, one of the stanzas, and then the poets follow them in a sort of alteration of terse sets, so three liners, and then the second poet does a doublet or a couplet, two lines, and then the third does a terse set. It's actually very simple alternating lines, uh, and we're going to uh, try and make that work. And then the next poet then will open the nautical twilight and, and then and on we go. We are also summarizing the, the, um, the, um, the stanzas with a refrain, which um, we, if we can, and if we get comfortable enough, all of us less nervous, we will sort of do as we go. They are summaries of each stanza. As the host, uh, it is my privilege to open so I will now write, but the way we do it is that we, we speak the line actually, then we write it down. Um, we can all look at it a little bit and then the poet who follows the, uh, that line will start to, we share thoughts around it. And then the poet that starts the following line will start to generate their own line. During which time we can then talk a little bit, keep, you know, keep the conversation going around the process. Um, we are a little bit short of time, like if you know, we've done some complicated calculation on the stanza time we have allocated. I won't share that with you because then it's gonna feel like speed writing, but you know, we are basically on a schedule. So let me, let me, uh, let me start. Let's start here. In these dark times, is there relief at in between hours? So I'll write it down. Let's start here. In dark times, is there relief at in between hours? Oh, like this. And I think, Will, when you can proceed, you will, we, we have to make a gap or something so that we can see, we can remember where we are or something like that. Let's start here simply because it is the opener of the project, of um, our collaboration. Um, and I often, in a lot of my projects, I do have salutations. I, I enjoy welcoming the audience or welcoming the reader into my work. Uh, so I often open literally with a direct address. And I thought that this address here was a way of announcing the themes, but then also, um, you know, sort of welcoming the collaborative gestures. So with the triple twilight, is that, does that suggest like curfew? Sorry? Does that suggest like, cur like a curfew? The in-between hours? The in the civil twilight, as the civil, no, these these are terms for astro these are astronomical time, so they're not actually connected to 
they're not actually connected to civilian time as such, apart, you know, apart from, but they calculate the night. So the civil twilight at the moment, for example, is starts at quarter to nine and finishes at 21, 28. I mean, of course, in, in, in the times we live at the moment, we can be imagining you know, that twilights mm. also represent the type of lockdown or curfews we get, we've been going through. But from the point of view of the term itself, it, in itself, that it doesn't indicate social time in that way. Mm. It's interesting. So, so this is basically the time when sunset occurs yes. during civil twilight. Should I, as I um, think up, write my response to it, should I give my, my thought process into how I would respond to this? If Wonderful. So I guess when I start writing, I, I think I often begin like a like a bad stand up with, with puns. So when I see like civil, I'll like look at that. I guess I might, I might look up the um, etymology of it or I'll think about it civil like, and I know it has, it, I, it has some relationship to, to law, but it's like a legal matter, which is neither canon law nor criminal law, it's civil law, so between citizens. And then I might think about quotes like in um, Romeo and Juliet, that it kind of brings that to mind immediately where civil blood makes civil hands unclean, which makes me think of cavil, even though they have no etymological link to cavil, to quibble, to argue. And then in your, what you've written here, it's interesting you've written in between hours, which is what we're writing about, this point of twilight, which is in between, which is the social thing between two people. So immediately you've got civil, cavil, arguing, and then relief, the idea of relief, both as a kind of taking away duress, but also as a kind of almost visual metaphor for a kind of, um, something where something's been carved away in order to expose something, which is kind of the opposite of how you think about night, because night is where relief disappears because everything is kind of blanketed with darkness. Um, and yet, I guess that's the kind of starting point, like with a kind of lino block before you kind of get the relief. That's right, yeah. So from that, I would then, <laughs> I would then write something. So you've got um, two lines, two lines to play with. Two lines to play with. Two, okay. two lines to play with. And yes, indeed, the to think about the transition. So the way of the passing of the line. So with, in whichever way you choose. So. Okay. And it's interesting. And we're kind of working out how closely these link to each other as we're writing this. Absolutely, mm. because it's going to be very difficult to go back. So that's why we follow the, the preceding mm. line. We don't go over the whole poem. We just follow the preceding line. Mm, but as in how closely? Oh, yeah. Should that I? Is, no, you go, you go where you need to go. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to write the first thing which came to my head. Yeah. Um, And you know, the twilights are all connected to, they all will lead to night, basically, all of our twilights. They just go darker and darker and gets tougher and tougher to, to see, basically. Are you right? Are you writing there, Will? Or I am. Yeah, I'm actually. Should I write? Do you think I should write it in the note? I got a little bit self-conscious. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, we are. I'm um, at the moment. I'm so I'm having to be the timekeeper. It's going to okay. be a bit rough initially. Don't worry. You okay. Know, I'm, I'm I'm sort of lucky in that sense that I had a, a while to sort of prepare something to welcome the process, but. Um, We've got another 15 minutes on the remaining stanzas, the remaining sections of this stanza. Okay. And we have, we need okay, to... so I gotta go right now, okay. Uh, if you don't mind, and you know what, we'll go back on things, you know, when we can. We'll just re-examine things, don't worry.
And I didn't release the, um, didn't release the, uh, who's coming next, but Vani will be, we'll be responding to Will, or we're continuing down the pond. So I can't see you still, Will, are you? Oh, sorry, I'm here. <laughs> I am. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. I'm just going to try and post. So if you if you've just joined us and you are interested in being part of the poem, basically we are organizing it as an alternation of three liners and mm -hmm. two liners for each stanza taking us through the twilight into the night. <laughs> oh, sorry, should I say it? Yeah, well? yeah, that would be lovely if you don't mind speaking it. Sorry, should I repeat um, what you've written? Or no, just... not at all. No, 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 okay. just yours. Okay, Henry Cavill, hands clean, relieves himself to your face and leaves. Thank you. I don't, I don't ask for comments because I, don't, I have no idea how we're all going to move around. So we leave it as it is. If any of the other poets have comments or thoughts, please do. But otherwise, it's Vani who continues. And I think we'll get warmer and it'll be easier to generate. So there's some very nice uh, alliterations in those. And those lines you put down. So, Vani. Yeah, I'm um, the next person, and you can probably hear the rain more than you can hear my voice. <laughs> and I, I, I'm not going to try to stick to any sort of uh, Renga syllabic count. No, no, not at all. No, and I think it's really interesting, relieves himself to your face and leaves, because I keep thinking your face doesn't really have anything to do with me. I never think that the you in the poem is really addressing me. So okay. I'm feeling that's either the audience or mm. night itself. And yes. I'm wondering what happens. Wondering who the you is. Wondering who the you is. Yeah, exactly. Especially perhaps here in this shared environment where we might take things on that sort of more responsive note as well and therefore respond or react to the to that address basically if it is seen to be an address or whether it's a narrative a description of an action. I, um, I, I'm obsessed with that in, um, in Sonnet 94, the line about being the lords and owners of your faces, you know, um, yeah. those uh, those yes, who are I mean, who are moving. Lilies at first, uh, lilies at first smell far worse than weeds. That one, yeah. they are the lords, uh, others but stewards of their excellence. Yeah, by by who? It sorry, just, uh, it's a Shakespeare. It's the Sonnet ninety four. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But just the idea, there's something so strangely uh, disembodied and disso disassociated about being the owner of your face, as if, which I don't know which. But it's, it's kind of like, I mean, it's one of those lines which there's been like endless criticism on, uh, written about because it, it doesn't, it, it's so, it's kind of dense and strange and yeah. Mm. But I, I've always really connected to it. Because um, I've always felt like my face is something which is, that I kind of, that, that is kind of separate, that I own. I always hate looking in mirrors, so I was sometimes like surprised. Like, oh, I own this face. Mm. <laughs> it's one of the great moments in, in V.S. Nepal uh, where a character looks in the mirror and doesn't see himself. Mm. And I think that happens in mirrors at twilight, mirrors at night. I don't yeah. know if other people have this, uh, but I, I don't mind being among, among mirrors most of the time in the dark mm. or in the day. But mm. if it's twilight, I really hate passing a mirror and catching a glimpse of myself. 
Mm. I've always expected to be doing something other than what I'm doing. Mm. And of course, the yeah. trope of horror movies as well, where you either see a face that isn't yours or you see no face at all when you look in the mirror. So there's yeah. also always that trope as well. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I mean, always, I'm always fascinated by, by this idea of symmetry in when you look at the mirror and you realize that your face and pretty much everything is not symmetrical. There is, like, you know, the mm -hmm. details that, tell, you know, that, and that kind of, it can be quite um, uh, terrifying, um, realizing that, you're, that there is no symmetry, that there is no, uh, in your face, in, in everything that is, you know, surrounds you. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a, there's a wonderful project by um, an artist, a Polish artist called uh, Krzysztof Budziszko, a piece of work that I really, really love of his called Mouthpieces, in which he, he's an engineer as well, and he constructed these sort of masks, these speaking masks um, for people to wear uh, that are where before that there's a video in it as well, and so they tell their story, they tell their life story, and it seemed to be a sort of triangulation, so it's about setting up dialogue. Mm. So this is very much for new arrivals to the to to the United States. But th these photos are extraordinary because you see, you know, that it could nearly be the monstrous face, and at the same time, this is a face about to set up dialogue, and it does work. It works mm. in that exchange that this extra face, if you like, is actually setting up, allowing for dialogue. Perhaps because of you know the the nervousness we all had of being exposed. Here, suddenly, you can tell your story, but you are sort of not exposed. There's a video right between you, you know. It's, it's a very interesting thing of the, the difficult, you know, process of dialogue being set up through this intersection of it. Mm. Mm. Making even stranger in order to facilitate dialogue is more or less what it is, which I think is such a very, very interesting risk-taking process, you know. And, mm. Mm. Uh, Vani, we need That's your really line because we are already, go oh by God, already night has fallen way, way <laughs> ahead of us. <Yeah. laughs> We've got three minutes left now for this stanza. We are we might have to sort yeah. of take a slow route through. But, um, the idea of go oh, on. sorry, please go. Oh, the Vanny's idea of making it stranger to facilitate dialogue. I was just yeah. thinking, I've um, over during lockdown, um, I've been having I've been continuing my therapy sessions, but via Zoom. Yeah. And last week, the, the, the was the first um, first time the technology really failed us. And there was this absolutely huge lag and the, it was all distorted. So in the end, we had to both look away from the screen and talk. You know, it's, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, ultimately, we, we could probably have just turned off our cameras and done it, but we couldn't work out how to do that. Yes. So it did feel, but it actually was one of the best sessions we've had. And it, it made me think of like a kind of Catholic confessional and just like looking into this, this kind of, you know, uh, yeah, into darkness Dark and, and, and nothing yes. and yeah exactly. exactly and the way that kind of opens you up and i kind of always thought that one of the best things about therapy was the kind of human interact with the face yes. but actually maybe removing the, the face from it made it more interesting well of course psychoanalysis you are lying down so you don't see your therapist so yes that's you know, true there's that other so just for our viewers uh, if you are wanting to contribute or send comments please find us on hashtag night and refuge we are we have michaela is there waiting for your comments and, and even your questions, which we'll field later on, or your poems, your poetic lines. Perhaps you are managing to speed us along with um, your work on the twilight. Through the red arch, six degrees from evening, your head beneath the pillar of night reflects joined to itself beneath the water. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vani. That's Great. <laughs> I'm, I might have to. Is, is that the six degrees below the, the horizon? Is it? Is, is that the direct? Yeah, I'm illusion? sorry. I got yeah. very numerically obsessed yeah, by this. Great. great. Excellent. Very beautiful. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. And six, the, the sixth line. I is didn't that? do that on purpose. I didn't. I swear I didn't do that. Really? Because. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay. Because now I. Yeah, that's great. I'm imagining the poem is like a latitudinal graph, longitudinal. But as the sun declines, so is the twilight measured. Yeah. Yes. And this one is the first one, it's six degrees, and then it goes down to 12, I believe, and it continues down, down until the deeper night. So. This makes me so happy we've got numbers. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, we should, I usually put the hours here uh, along the civil twilight, the, the, the time of, 
of, of day or the time that it actually hits. But because also we occupy in different time zones, it felt perhaps a little bit aleatory to do so. But the one that I have followed is the, is the British one. I found myself in, in Norway where the, the, um, the dark night is already much later and, and much reduced in relation to, um, in, in relation to England. Uh, I think of next poets, unless you want to speak a bit more, or I think it's Nisha, is that right? Nisha, mm -hmm. if you want to comment or not comment, you know, or describe or see what you are thinking about in relation to either these lines or just as you continue us down. Mm -hmm. um, well, it was funny because when you, there was a discussion about the sonnet and the being the master and lord of the faith. I, I felt a bit like, um, it made me think that I don't feel that I own my faith because I'm not the one who experiences it <laughs> the most. Mm. And that the people, it's a bit like the Will's work on like being rend, on being rendered and so on. Like I feel a bit like the, the, the beholder has some claim on me that I don't even have on myself. Um, and of course you're so right, isn't it? Isn't that the idea of, of alterity as well, that that's exactly. That's exactly right. Sorry, I didn't mm. That you are seen, and when you are seen, that you acquire faith through being seen. Mm. Yeah, and especially with this, this format that we're using with Zoom, that we don't ever usually see ourselves when we speak to others. <laughs> we don't usually see how we perform. I've become so much more self-aware. I haven't had a single conversation where I haven't been looking at myself talking for the last two, two and a half months. Have you noticed anything like that well, you were surprised about? <laughs> well, so, I guess the face Nisha, thing. Yeah. You are, you, I think it's your couplet we're waiting for, Nisha. Yeah, oh, I yeah. know. Yeah, so uh, perhaps... Um, we, we can keep on talking while you are thinking through it, perhaps, uh, unless you are doing all this because you are generating this, um, <laughs> your line. But, um, yeah, perhaps I the poet can't talk. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, I'm going to be this chair initially, but you'll see it loosen out over time. It's just to get us going. But literally wanting to ask, perhaps we've just talked about Zoom, we've talked about our faces, uh, wondering how you are perceiving your writing process in these times. And that's a question we can address as we go along. But in relation to this question of refuge um, as poets, and then this lockdown, this confinement, this sort of, you know, the, the alone together type thing, but then as writers, how, how are you and how are you finding it's affecting potentially the way you, you view your role as poets? So I think this is one question that I'll be interested in, in us sort of grappling with as we, as we write, as we go along. Um, and, you know, if any one of you, you know, have had sort of direct direct um, issues with, with the confinement and writing, or in fact, perhaps a sense of having to rethink public place as a poet during this time. Mm -hmm. uh, I've noticed immediately a lot of poets went straight onto Instagram with, with performances and readings. And that was, I thought, a wonderful thing where you have this, you have this easy access to poetic voices and performances uh, on Instagram. Uh, which I thought was such an interesting mm. response, a direct response, you know, as a public address, the poet taking up that solo space, if you like, you know. often very informal. And which has become more international as well. Yeah. Now, all because Instagram readings, you can have people, well, I guess, or like this event here, kind of at, in different corners of the globe, simultaneously. Absolutely. Yeah. Which has been, which has been nice. How about you, Leo? Because you've been out, out of London. Um, it's been quite hard, actually. Um, I've got these recurrent dreams of not being able to go back to London and my life in London. Um, although it's, it's nice to be by the sea and, and the sea is quite important for me, especially now being able to swim every day. Um, still, I feel like I'm really cut off and uh, from friends, from, from life in London. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, and, and, and this recurrent dream of being able to go back to, to London. And, um, and yeah, I guess I, um, the moment the, they announced the lockdown, I began writing these haikus, um, mm. thinking 
like like peoples like this sort of knotting this knots this peruvian um, traditions of uh, tradition of kind of knotting making knots. oh yes what is it called again Qu um, uh, peoples that's peoples. right peoples yeah um, so I began writing these haikus every day as sort of as a way of surviving um, mm. and also in a way it was a little bit of like a journal and I kept writing them and I wrote more and more and I've got now a lot of haikus and, and it's pretty much the only thing I can write. It's almost like this fragmentary, it's very tiny, minute sort of details, uh, mostly related to what's was is around me mostly nature but sometimes it's just uh, thoughts um ideas but in this very strict form yeah. it's counting uh, five seven five um the syllabics um and it kind of kept me going in a way um that's and interesting. yeah and so that's why um i, I yeah when i when I, I went back and read renga um, yes. I was fascinated, you know, by the haikus as well. And, yes, and, absolutely. Um, so, I felt yeah. that to, um, to impose that strict structure on this um, meeting would be too strong. So I kept the name and used the idea of link verse, but otherwise you're absolutely right that the renga is, of course, the collaborative practice of, of link verse, of haiku. Yeah. yeah. How wonderful this idea oh. of strictness of poetic. In fact, you need to start developing your, your, your couplets, but this is something we can perhaps keep on thinking about this idea of the strictness of a poetic discipline you know often you know you you find in situations of isolation that one has to recourse when one has to yeah recourse to 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 sort of regular or disciplined measures as a way of thinking as a way of generating thought or as a way of perhaps you know staying sane as well so any and does any one of you also find yourself developing other types other types of practices that keep you thinking, that keep you in the world, that keep you thinking, but perhaps also on a centering level, an individual level. Is it changing you and, and do you have such a practice? We are... Mm. Sorry. So we're gonna uh -huh. basically write Nisha also, time. we didn't uh, we didn't actually hear Nisha. Nisha, you need to speak it because we actually speak. were talking and and lovely to see the hyphenation of your faces there. Can you um, can you read your line? The exposure is never symmetrical, nor at twilight, a cast of your faces backlit by not Hollywood stars. So basically, I wrote a uh, height. Uh, um and thinking about this idea of noche night and what i mean I say noche i'm talking about when i left park in argentina if then the nights i remember are, are those or if chairs are the i see and experience right now here in the uk um this idea of light and the pure light mm. And, and, and cold. So on the other side of La Noche, the civic twilight, pure old light. So interesting, the association of night and light. And of course, the more we're going to be moving into night, the more there's going to be that internal light, the nocturnal light that comes to play as well in the, in the imagination. But so interesting to see that uh, represented through the through the gold already I find of, of that light. Mm. I have some, uh, we're going to move to the second stanza, but we're receiving some wonderful comments. So let me read um, some of them from, or I'm just going to read first names from Orchid. We are receiving a comment that says, as in between spaces, the twilight is a walking ghost. Orchid Tony, who's an American poet, Kat Chong, says, watching the Night and Refuge event at almost 2 a.m., thinking about poetry, refuge, and the stages of night is an incredible use of insomnia. That's, that's exactly right. Perfect. That's exactly why I was asking the question about discipline, <laughs> how we are setting up regular structures, perhaps as new poetic processes for those of us who might not have these strict... I don't know, Leo, perhaps you do apply yourself that strictly as a haiku, but from you saying to have it as a daily practice, yeah. it also, yeah. Exactly, yeah, as a way, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Amy Evans Bauer here, who says, clocked face to face to face past five, past six degrees, 
try by try or three by three, no, try by try lit. Thank you. Please continue. I'm going to be as best I can. I'm going to be reading, reading your uh, contribution, your comments. Thank you. So we are moving into rapidly. In fact, we have been now, let me just, I'm trying to keep track of time. As Nisha asked me, we are 40 minutes in. So let me stop this and start again in the sense that it is 30 minutes by stanza. So I've, I've clocked it back down now. Um, I wish we had the time to go back on the first stanza and then set up our refrain. This is, I think, something we're gonna have to re-examine, I think, you know, how we do, but thank you for this, you know, really interesting start from each of you. We are moving into a darkening, further darkening of twilight. Um, this is the nautical twilight on the time zone. Let me see, on the time we're at now, where did I put my map uh, for the time? Okay, so in England, nautical twilight would be from 21.28 to 22.25. It's still called twilight, it's still the dusk, it's still announcing the depth of night, if you like having past sunset. So the shapes might be less, mm. slightly less, to be less clear. Some artificial light might be needed as we are entering this phase. I'm not sure when the cat and wolf hour is, Vani. Do you remember yeah. when we talked about it the other day, whether it might happen at this time, actually, when there's that weird ambiguity of what you see and that French expression entre chien et loup, where you don't know what you're seeing coming towards you very dangerous when you're driving, but quite extraordinary moment of talk about faces of unidentification. Now the total impossible to, to determine what one is seeing. I wonder who is starting this nautical I, twilight. I think I'm Will. starting this one. We're starting, that's great. And that's a terset, so three liner. Uh, great. And Slowly, don't forget what to be thinking about as well. Now, we are very much looking at faces and referencing of the face, I thought was so interesting in relation to dialogue and this idea of refuge, mm -hmm. this idea of where does one rest? How does one find rest? And does one rest in one's face? And is, is that a point of rest? Is mm -hmm. that a masking that allows for rest? Yeah. Nautical twilight. When I was thinking about this, I thinking I guess this is the time of night where I probably would have uh, been been put to put to bed when I was a child and um, I was thinking about languages because a lot of us are well actually I'm not bilingual but a lot of a few of the other poets here are yeah. multilingual um, but my mum is uh, Indonesian and so she would so I she didn't pass on the language to me but there were a few phrases she used and one of them was uh, Salamat Malam which is Good night, uh, and malam is night in Bahasa, Indonesia. The other, the other phrase you would use would be stomach tito, which is, which is another way of saying good night. But I was thinking of mal malam in particular because that always felt like a, a kind of false friend to me as a child. Even though my mum said it so many times, I always thought stomach malam was good morning because it because of the M link in my yeah. head. Yeah. Mal malam, it just didn't feel. It has never felt like a night word to me. Um, Whereas Tidur actually always seemed like a night word. Like it sounds to me like the sound of like, it's, and also because in Indonesian you roll your R's. So she was, I can't really do it so well, but she would say Tidur, 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 um, which sounds really like lulling and night, nighttime, mm. nighttime. Um, this is very much this idea, isn't it? That the absolute reality of the sound is the sense of the word, isn't it? And this is how, as very young children, that's how we make those connections. And that, that you just described just now, that the T sounds more like night, also because of the assimilation later on. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Um, but, uh, so is this very much a familial setting for you that this language itself brings up a sense of, we're talking yeah. about faces and time, another time, another, you know, something that perhaps mm. is, is is within you but without a face potentially or on the contrary it has a very specific face the face of your mother or how do how do you how do you relate to these these very intimate sounds yeah that's true i guess i do 
they do place me immediately within a a very specific intimate setting like it's not i guess i i had there were times when we'd visit indonesia and i talked to well i'd hear my family talk but mainly it's just yeah my mom repeating these phrases so it's very yeah it's it's a kind of unusual exposure to a language i guess and, and my mom didn't have any other indonesian friends really um or none that, that i saw very often so yeah so these words are the words that are in your family the words that sort of make your family make that specific sort of make that specific mm. environment as well isn't it yeah i have the yeah. i had the sense growing up french and norwegian with my parents refusing to speak only only training us in each their languages and um, refusing to speak uh, other languages uh, to us and so for me we would be sitting at dinner and you you know uh, whenever I moved my face to face my father who spoke Norwegian or my mother who spoke French, my whole, I, cha I, I had to change. I had to code switch into Norwegian and then turn back to the left and then code switch into, into French. And French, it was the vehicular language in the, in the family. But that was, that's, that's something that's always, that I found really fascinating, the mechanics of the hold of that, you know, again, the face and the, and the sound of the voice of the father has its own very specific, an unavoidable language in the mechanics of my my memory if you like very much like you described as well so do we have your your toe set will um and while we are while we are seeing you right i'm going to be reading some more comments from tender button express that's in new york leanne brown most likely civil twilight i am making lunch long before civil twilight squeezing lemons like spicer whose song is like a wave civilians watch each other on stadium walls as the lights go down she serves she rallies they tally up the score this is so wonderful thank you so much for sending these in as we are mm. here trying to compose as well this is wonderful and from Juni, julie mackelon from sweet sydney at 3 a.m are you here in social time and Ali, an ally in unseen things, fire release, bright spark, sharp tack, turning Gertie, pop face. Let's say your contours are supposed to make small talk and they fail you. Interesting with the face, the small talk of the contour, much more than an alterity, a mindful refuge cut off. All these you will find if you go to uh, hashtag night and refuge. I'm sorry that I rushed through them. These are very beautiful and really feed our conversation here. Contours and faces and now the outlines slipping away as we are waiting for Will's Oh sorry, yeah. Okay. On the nautical twilight. Leo, do you see any um lighthouses where you are? Um Mm, yes, actually, yeah, I can see France from from where I am, and and Belgium, and there is a lighthouse. Uh, I think it's in between Bruges and Dunkirk, and you can see it at night. Oh. And you can see some light, uh, um, lighthouses in France as well, um, and of course in the middle of the Godwin Sands, uh, between England and the continent, there are these treacherous sands. Yeah, actually, Shakespeare mentions them in The Merchant mm -hmm. of Venice. Uh, and there's been many, many uh, shipwrecks, uh, like thousands. Um, and it's really interesting because um, at low tide, they, they form like a sort of an island. And they, in, during the Victorian times, people from Deal used to go there to have tea, um, set up the kind of tea you know, tables and stuff. Um, uh, I've never been, but uh, you can see you can see the Godwin Sands um, sometimes. Yeah, the waves breaking. Uh, oh, wow. that also, I suppose pirate activities. I was I was working in uh, in Devon for many years, and uh, an immense amount of pirate activities along the uh, along the southwest coast. Again, by mm -hmm. moving lighthouses, and I think that's a classic way mm -hmm. of forcing a shipwreck. You know, yeah, and, yeah, and, 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 and smugglers. Indeed, there were lots of smugglers. Yeah. So every time there was a shipwreck, they would go with the uh, boats to try try to get as much as possible um wine or you know whatever they could they could get um so yes aha will will you read your line yeah tudor and malam 
familial night-like stair-light tiding at the door. Mm. And just the nautical with the tide huh, coming in as well. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. S waves, sleep. Yeah. Mm. Kind of you had insomnia. Like and there were so many. Yeah. No, you've had. Yeah. Did you, did you say you've had insomnia? Recently? No, I'm looking at. I'm remembering the the uh, the um, the comment we got from Pat oh, yeah. that she has insomnia and uh, mm. and this is a way of of fighting it off. Yeah. Tea, dude. Tiding and tea, dude. It's interesting. I'm speak. I'm I'm saying. I read tea, dude, immediately as a Norwegian. And but uh, I can see the tide, the tea, dude, and the tiding or the tide or and the tiding. Yeah, mm. it's great. Does um wait? Does it does it mean something in does it mean something in uh, Norwegian? Tea, tea dude. Well, yeah. it might mean something in Old Norse, and Vani would be better equipped for me to answer. But tea in Norwegian is time. Um, oh, so is in time and time and tide wait for no. Yes, no man. Yeah, you're right. You know, it might be. It might have a connection. How interesting. But it's also a way of counting time. It was also a way of measuring time, mm. wasn't it? This whole idea of tide. So perhaps that's where that comes from as well. But mm. I would have to double check and I can't just, you know, go and do that now. The, uh, do you know, Vani, if tea dude, a tide, a tea in Norwegian, if, if that was perhaps the old, the old Norse tea dude, does that ring a bell to you? Or? Yeah, that, that's also a time word. Uh, I have to confess I've only just started hearing again. Uh, Oh. Because the rain has been so loud on the roof, I've been hearing scraps of your words. Uh, but that makes me very like the person who's on a bed uh, drifting off to sleep. Uh, like somebody in Will Harris's lullaby. You know <laughs> when you drift off to sleep, you feel as if your bed is a ship and it's yeah. rocking slightly on its moorings. Uh, and yeah. then scraps of images and words from the outside start to mm. mingle with the dream world in your head. Uh, it, it's been a little bit like that and I've been trying not to think of Mayakovsky and uh, you know, using a, a drain pipe for flute to play a nocturne. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Are you wanting a couplet from me soon? Yes, that would be amazing. If you have it, that'd be fantastic. I'm going to see. Nobody do any magic about the rain, by the way. Just no, let the can't. climate do yeah. Don't, I mean, seriously, don't. Let the climate do its own effed up thing. Sure. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, sadly, we can't even hear it. So I think that's very sad. It would have been amazing. Really if you heard it. At all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you have your couplet, uh, I will, we will receive your couplet. Fantastic. Can you read it, please? My captain adrift with eyes that never naked net small stars. Mm. And what mm. I'm thinking of there partly is, uh, I mean, obviously there's the John Macefield, isn't it? Uh, the oh, captain, my captain. But I was thinking mm. of drift, which also is one of your words, Caroline, drift. Uh, but then eyes that are never naked, uh, because either there is what we are seeing uh, with our eyes open uh, if we're sighted, uh, or what we see by the inward light or vision within our heads. Yes. Uh, yes. I believe National Poetry Day's theme is vision. And, uh, and uh, there's uh, that question as well of the pure damage to eyes. Uh, so mm. I don't know about you, but my eyes are full of drifters and sunspots and little sunbursts, uh, mm. migraine auras and purple and gold. Uh, so, and then when I close my eyes, I see these sequins, white and blue sequins and star falls. Uh, so if you're actually trying to focus on the stars in the night or whether you close your eyes, uh, there's a lot of interference. Mm. There's also the question of, of lens corrections. If you're partially sighted, which I am, and you wear glass contact lenses and you fall asleep in them, which is incredibly painful, you do mm. have the sense of, of something pressing into the flesh of the eye, mm. the mm. eye being in some way dressed, mm. not just a window or a membrane. So the way we perceive the night, then the senses by which we perceive the night, maybe inward senses, uh, or they may be flawed senses, uh, 
well, sight may give way to memory and touch and hearing. And here comes the rain. I'm going to mute. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are slowly moving. It seems towards interiority, and although it still is pretty bright in all our different twilights. There is a sense of interiority, it seems, that is mm. also starting to set in here. Um, I, interiority. I, I love that eyes, yeah. ne never naked eyes. Absolutely. That's yeah. such a resonant, slightly kind of paradoxical idea. Mm. Yeah. idea. And the no, 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 the right. never naked net, you know, yeah, net so it's right. really like this jumping, you know, along like these stars of these continuums. It, so, it makes me it feels like it's a response to in um, the Ralph Waldo Emerson essay, uh, Nature. He talks about becoming a transparent eyeball. And that's the whole idea behind um, American transcendentalism, yes. this idea that you go out into the world and you disappear into it. Mm. But this idea here of drifting and my captain, which feels quite... Absolutely. You know, such a, yeah. Whit Whitman, old oh, captain, my captain. Absolutely. But I drifting, mm. but your eyes aren't naked. You're mm. They're capturing things. They're netting things all the time. Like... I think that's that feels right writer to me because I can never I can never feel transparent or naked in the world. I'm always aware of I guess that like we were saying earlier of mm. being present, being mm. like sin, being fallen and sinful and feeling my presence tainting and marring everything. Or not in a bad way as well. <laughs> <laughs> also also shaping and changing and yeah. creating. Yeah. Um it's interesting, this idea of nakedness, especially for the eyes. It is so interesting, such a, a bizarre or it's peculiar, peculiar yeah. concept to be relating to. That's not where we place nakedness. And yet it is the eyes that also see, relate to nakedness. So that's also quite an interesting paradox of, I thought that you were describing it yourself, Annie, of the moving inwards because of the, because of the physical migraines, but then also what it generates by way of, of, uh, of memory and perception. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are receiving while well, we are i think who is writing the next uh, i am you anisha so while we are waiting for yours i will be reading a few more if that's okay uh, let me see gosh they're coming in so we have from vera Lin oh gosh uh, i might have to start going backwards now because we are they really coming in fast and so from mary maria Cassori, thinking of eyes like ship windows Mm, yeah, the portholes. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Alison Adair, etymology of tide. Ah, thank you very much, Alison. Etymology of tide as time. Old English teed, time period era of Germanic origin related to Dutch teed, T I J D, and German zeit. Fascinating. Feel like I should have known this, but did not. Thank you, Alison, for this. That's mm. great. And Rob, Robert Caring, like stairs, light underfoot. Each step to sleep, the same rhythm and height. Mm. Old Chip Tien is writing another one. Six de uh, the six degrees from separating. Six degrees from separating. This oh, day yeah. from this <laughs> evening. Yeah, it's great. This touch <laughs> is temporary. Oh, talk about touch and lockdown experiences. That I thought is so interesting in relation to again the, the distancing we we're going through and the idea of touch being temporary, even um forbidden as as we go davinia hamilton night is rarely a mirror of day asymmetrical as the face you own but do not behold the promise of evening is a lie ah, the promise of evening is a lie mm -hmm. and vera yeah. linder if night is tower dark is brick our faces sidewalk two dares walking on them i'm mm -hmm. reading them as they come up because these are I receive them as texts, SMS from Michaela. So some of your line breaks have been changed, but thank you again. And please keep, keep doing this. I think it's really fantastic for us because we get all, this, all these beautiful, in fact, constellations of voices and thoughts about the night um, mm. that inhabit what we are doing. Mm. Um, who, so Nisha uh, is- Oh yeah, um, great. Um, this Aha. shift to lockdown's dim enlightenment, the safety of connection brought into relief. Lenses, windows, souls tessellating on screen. Mm. And I guess, yeah, well, not 
just re returning to what we've been talking about and eyes and and eye fatigue and dryness and, <laughs> and this weird thing of being our, you know like eyes as the windows to the souls but like being mediated all the time now by cameras and lenses and electromagnetic waves well that's a really good point nisha in terms of bringing the idea of surveillance mm. because something we haven't thought about so far are uh, all the technologies for night vision and uh, mm. the ways in which the night is transparent to those who control us and uh, i mean unless of course there are some secret spies among the poets so i was not there i'm not one then you know <laughs> we're being surveyed yeah, but we're not able to survey yeah yeah which is another way in which we don't own our faces because Zoom probably mm. owns all of our faces now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the other thing is touch, the touch, and people have been going on about the starvation of touch, uh, but mm. in the hyper-sexualized uh, modern world, uh, which for which I utterly condemn modernity, <laughs> there's been uh, a, a kind of conflation of sexuality and touch, or touch and ownership. Uh, and I think that long before lockdown, many people have been starved of touch, because unless you have somebody you're having sex with or you're in a biological relation with uh, like birth family, then you're basically not going to get touched, not unless you go to the hairdresser. And I think there are poets exploring this. So someone like Amy Key, for example, mm -hmm. is really, really good in issues of starvation of touch and what otherwise seems like a normal modern life. Mm. Um. So I, I read what I wrote. Leo, yeah. A song on a boat. I travel through the night, get nowhere. Donde estoy? What island harbors me? A doorless house, a lightless night, a gate to get to the other side. And I was thinking about this idea of crossing this sea or this river, this idea of traveling um, and the night um, not allowing me to see where I am. Um, and also the idea of refuge. Yeah, uh, other, this, yeah. yeah, the island and the house without doors. And, and also when you get to the other side, um, there is a gate. And, and sometimes that gate is blocked or closed. So the idea of, of traveling and, and the sea and um, yeah I guess the first a song on a boat I was kind of, you know traveling with this kind of hope um, yeah I just realized uh, it's my turn so please continue please uh, please keep on sharing some of these yeah. thoughts while I develop my toaster because I have been so involved in talking that I have not do, uh, developed it. Uh, do you think? Do you think you can touch touch people with your eyes? Mm. And, oh yes, isn't that isn't that a Tudor conceit that your eye beams can twist? Uh, mm. uh, Nisha, have you looked into any ideas of being able to touch with the eyes? Uh, because I, I'm fairly sure there are ideas of connection through the eyes in tantra, but I wouldn't know enough. Oh, I'm not. It's not. I haven't come across it actually. I mean. Because I guess I, I, I maybe I, I feel more a sense of being being able to touch through sound because of the way in which sound permeates the body. And, you know, so like I there's something because, yeah, I don't know, there are limits to vision, but sound sort of can go through different like surfaces and spaces. But that that's just um. Yeah, but also the feeling of being touched by the eyes, I, like I associate that too with a feeling of being really uncomfortable. Of, mm. you know, like. <laughs> I had a really strange experience once in a very busy street uh, when I asked a man for directions to a certain place uh, mm -hmm. and he didn't know the directions to the place. So, so it's a little bit like the person in your boat, Leo. Mm. And uh, then I walked on and it was a very busy and noisy street. I walked on more than two blocks and then I felt somebody pulling the back of my shirt. So I turned around and nobody was near me. Nobody was pulling the back of my shirt. But the, the man was looking at me from a very long distance away. So I walked back towards him because he was looking at me so intensely. 
and he had got to the direction to the place I wanted to go to. And I still don't understand what happened there. I, I literally felt his eyes in my back. Mm -hmm. And I think we have reduced versions of this, like in the gym, if you're waiting for gym equipment and someone's staring at you, and even if there isn't a mirror, you know that they're eyeing you up and you know they want to be on the pull-down machine or whatever. Mm -hmm. But this was so bizarre because there was traffic and, and all sorts. And I really felt pulled and it was simply his gaze. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think all of us must have experienced that sometime, that feeling. <laughs> yeah, you definitely can sense it. I'm sure that that must be it. And it, it makes me think of the of one of the reasons why night is a refuge, because it's a refuge from people's eye. from stares, from touch, mm. from the eye, from the eye. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. And I guess why some people see that, get scared by that, because they can't rely on the, the eye, they have to maybe rely on hearing, on tr the trust of voice and other, the other senses. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm just coughing out for a minute. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, is it my turn? It is my turn, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Mm. Did um, do you you said you were reading uh, some Renga, Leo? Uh, yeah, I was reading the Renga, that kind of very uh, famous Renga, where Octavio Paz um, uh, participated. I think it was uh, a, an experiment um, done in the nineteen uh, sixties. Um, so they they gather together in a in a, a cafe in Paris uh, um, downstairs. And they they began writing this long poem, this Renga poem, but each in in their own language. So there was an Italian poet, a French poet, Octavio Paz from Mexico, um, and so creating this um, wonderful piece. You know, sometimes it's quite um, it doesn't make any sense, and sometimes it's just a word that someone picks you know, from mm. another language and sort of goes, you know, goes with, with that sort of sound. Um, but um, yeah, and I've been, I've been sort of experimenting with a, with a form called haibun. I don't know if you know about, oh, yeah. um, and it's basically a sort of a prose poem followed by um, a haiku. Um, and the, the more you do it, you get this kind of thread, again, this kind of um, weaving, this kind of knots connecting the text. Um, so visually, I find it really arresting this this idea that you connect these prose pieces through haikus that are tiny and fragile and somehow quite sort of yeah quite pure. I mean because it's so condensed um, and it's it's almost like those points of tension between uh, the prose poems. Um, so I've been reading some some haibun. So I, I can uh, put the um, oh yeah. The, uh, link, yeah. the, the link. I'm just gonna. I wrote my terset that closes the nautical twilight, feeding off some of our conversations and the lines above. A get to gate, a gate, a get to get, a get together, a gate to get, a gate to get, a gate to get. Oh, that's the thing. It would be lovely to move all the same performance, wouldn't it? A gate to get, a gate to get, a gate to get on board a ghost to push for light. A gate to get on board a ghost to push for light. That closes the uh, nautical uh, twilight, I believe. Uh, again, we don't have any time to look at the refrain, but I think the conversations here are so great. And I believe we have more um, lines that are coming in from people. Uh, you can join us if you're interested in commenting or sharing some of your tosses or couplets. You can share them on hashtag night and refuge. Uh, we are moving rapidly towards the darkening um, we're moving into the night with the astronomical twilight. The astro astronomical twilight is the final one before, it's the final point of dusk, if you like, before we enter what is called night proper. So at this time in England, uh, the astronomical, twi astronomical twilight is at 10, 10.25 p.m. and it lasts for an hour and a half. It's quite a long, slow process. 
and this is also when the when the dark night if you like is of summer is slowly being eaten up by the graying of the nautical the astronomical twilight It'll, the astronomical twilight will be longer and longer in the summer in the northern hemisphere when you are uh, at higher altitudes uh, in england at the moment it's one hour and 28 minutes but the night still dominates as you will see later so i believe um Vani is leading us with her tercet into this one, and I will be reading. So, Alice and Adair uh, sends us the quote by Emerson, well, that you were uh, mentioning. Oh. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all the currents of the universal being, of the universal being, circulate through me. I am part of God. We recognize very well there the whole. Transcendental Americanism. But. Yeah, wow. That must be that must be quite a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, re I remember. I can't remember that. That I think it's an essay, isn't it? Oh, is that a poem? I can't remember. But it's an it's an essay. It's long. Uh, it's yes. like a kind of book length essay. Oh, it is. Yeah, because I remember reading s through some of that, and it has a, an enormous sense of that sort of extraordinary utopianism and connection with with nature, God, and and the the poetic self, isn't it? Yeah. Davinia Hamilton, the eye yeah. at night, a bathysphere, bathysphere, bathysphere. Yeah, bathysphere. Those, those oh, little so early, is, they're little early, they're kind of like proto submarines, or they, ah. or maybe they're connected submarines, but under okay. uh, undersea exploration. Is that oh, right? but like not the scaphanders with a, do they have, they, they are free, they're, they're free to float, yeah? They are sort of small submarines, is that right? Or? Mm, yeah, but they're just a kind of small a little, okay. float thing. Like so I think they need to be attached to a boat or it's, usually. Oh, okay. So hang on. So her line is, the eye at night, a bathysphere, deep sea seeing things which, because forgotten, are deeper than darkness, but alive, yeah. but breathing. That's a fantastic way of really moving into, into darker twilights, but deeper than darkness, but alive, but breathing, because forgotten. So this question, we were starting to move into memory and this whole idea of the face, but then now we move into what we forget, so the, the forgotten memory, and then of course the sea mm. being so much part of that. Huh? Also very tragically, how the sea hides its, if you like, its murderous memories. Mm. And also I guess the sea is the metaphor for the subconscious, and that, that well. tipping point where you go into night, where the kind of subconscious starts to rise up as your yep. the kind of social memory of the day starts to withdraw or be kind of transformed maybe absolutely it reminds me when we were talking about the surveillance matter of this you know when i was working with my project drift i was looking at some of the material that forensic architecture have developed and they the, the project i was working on was looking at um a report of um, migrants lost at sea across the mediterranean and yet in full view of the extremely sophisticated surveillance systems. And in fact, the fact that everything is visible to those, to those hidden eyes, if you like. Um, and, and, and how the sea with all this technology is, becomes readable, becomes material, becomes retrievable. And of mm. course, then thinking of uh, Nobeza Philip Zong, you know, how material mm. deemed to have been forgotten, wanted to be pushed, you know, politically massacres pushed into the sea get retrieved through, in her case, legal documents. And in, in the case of the work I was doing through uh, digital technologies of surveillance used against their purposes. So very powerful how the unconscious, the cultural unconscious that the sea represents before sea suddenly is also, is carrying, directly carrying the traces of its, of, of, um, of massacres. No longer, so it's the return of the repressed, but you know, the irrepressible basically through, through materials. I think yeah. I have a test that... It is, oh, is it you, Vani? Yeah. It Fantastic. is, it is, and, and I just need to tell everyone that we're 18 degrees down now, the sun is in uh, declining by 18 degrees, uh, which uh, if you take 18 as, as a fraction, it's very, very small. 18 degrees and you compare it to say 360 degrees that's 0 0.05 and uh, there's something I'd like to say about uh, when the light seems to sift out from the day and this is a point made by Jack Bellolly whom everyone should be reading uh, though he doesn't write enough and uh, 
that is that for many people, nature is not a refuge. Uh, there are many people who inhabit the night. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that is their waking time or their working time. Uh, yeah. So I, I would like to think uh, of the, the sun as perpetual. Uh, so we are spinning in perpetual light uh, and night for us uh, is simply our tilting. It is, it is a tilting of our perception of light uh, yes. rather than an absence of light per se. And the other thing is for those of us privileged to keep the night as night, uh, there's a kind of understong, uh, which is uh, the, the, the sound, the perceived or imperceptible sound of the labor and living uh, of the many people for whom the hours of darkness are not hours of rest. So, mm. so my very clumsy terset, what we perceive as sinking is spinning. Light, unlike refuge, is perpetual. The purple bats are going to work like many others. We're a good few hours off, off dusk here in the tropics, but we do get fantastically large fruit bats and you can call them, they're going, <laughs> which is something I think everyone needs to know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You were talking about the night workers as well. And it reminds me of uh, Sukhdev Sandhu's amazing book, Night Haunts. I don't know if you, where he looks at a lot of nocturnal professions within London. So he mm. has, I think the sewage workers and the barge, the barge sailor, you know, uh, the barge sailors, and there's all sorts of hidden professions within the night of London that he covers and he goes and interviews them. And it's a beautiful book on night haunts. I also recommend that one. Mm. It reminds, me, reminds me of two other books as well. There's a great book by Jonathan Crary called 24 seven capitalism about the kind of growth of capitalism into the night. And another book, which I reviewed years and years ago um, called night walking by Matthew Bowman, oh, which is a kind of li yeah. literary, literary political history of the night up yeah. till the early 19th century and it's and it is it's a lot of it focuses on london and the way that the um, development the illumination of the Lo of london at night was a way of pushing the working poor into the margins like the illumination of the west end in particular mm. that used to be a, a much poorer part of london it was the, the light they they the reason the lights were erected was to push these communities out mm. further into the east east of london Mm. It's and it's really it's really striking the way this is a point Crary makes well the way you these these night workers become part of the invisible architecture of the city at night the city of night which whose only purpose is to kind of provide pleasure and stimulation to get you to spend money and these people are maintaining that so they don't so they kind of they just become part of the the architecture of capital rather than humans. Isn't it? Mm. There are also certain types of light which come on in the night. Uh, so, I mean, with the deportation of criminals from uh, the USA and so on, uh, ruining the culture here in the Caribbean, uh, then uh, many people who can afford it have installed security lights. Uh, and that, mm. of course, is terribly disruptive of the ecosystem. Uh, mm. And uh, one hears birds being very confused. They don't know what happened to the reproductive cycles. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and there's also this, this dreadful mm. sort of salty orange glow. The poet Claudia Daventry recently alerted me to the dark sky movement, uh, which is looking at light pollution and uh, sensible ways of, of trying to reduce that. Mm. It's, it's something I only felt viscerally, you know, with, with that, uh, almost synesthetically, with that sort of lacerating, uh, crisping, uh, acidulated, uh, citric edge that the sky mm. gets uh, from the, the, the night lights, which we now have. Yes. But I'm, I'm glad there's a whole movement addressing it. Absolutely. Mm. Be yeah. Mm. It's been extraordinary to be able to, to see some of these images about the, the noise, the light pollution over cities and how that has so much reduced that, you know, you can, I mean, I'm not in, in London at the moment, but that you can actually First of all, the air pollution has been much reduced, but also that the, the night sky is appearing again, you know, from so mm. many um, environments due to a sort of reduction in, in uh, illumination. The dark sky movement. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna be continuing while you are, oh, you have finished, was... Lisa, that's fantastic. 
you need to unmute yourself. Um, so I was just thinking, yeah, Barney's point or and Jack Belilly's point is completely true about um, who inhabits the night and night who is night a refuge for, same as who is home a refuge for, who is a refuge a refuge for. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, again, during the lockdown, like there's so much discourse about like, we this and you that and them and us and like without interrogation of who who are the people included or excluded by these pronouns and like for example this is a very ridiculous um debate going on on social media about like women who want their cleaners to come into work because the the amount of labor that's like domestic labor that's built up for them is killing them without like thinking at all about the women who they're asking to come in to clean their homes and like who is this we who's been killed by housework. It's not actually, <laughs> it's not the ones who are vocal about it. And I was just thinking about this, but it's never about individuals either. So it's like, it's about these structures that we, you know, we yeah. live within. And um, so, yeah, that was, that was what I was thinking about, uh, mm. uh, like spurred on by Vani and, um, yeah. <laughs> and like all the liquid zones, so all the liquid L's in mm -hmm. your, the liquid L's as well as the can you pronouns. Read it? Yeah, I can see those. They're beautiful, all these liquid L's. Can you read them, Nisha? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> impersonal there, falling shares in which impersonal we fall, unintelligible who fall in vain who while away stars. Mm. Oh. Personal we. Yeah, that feels like it links back to the, the kind of, the never naked eye mm. and the critique in that. But also this parenthesis, you know, the, the, the bracketing of there, the bracketing of we, the bracketing of who and who, you know, first of all, they set up that rhythm um, in, in the line, but also literally sort of putting them to question in that way, I find, because otherwise it would be falling shares in which. Mm. Uh, more comments from our friends. Uh, let me see. So Mary Maria Casoli, night boats, floats, songs, carry, the sound touches me while feeling blind. Orchid Tini, the sea is also symbolic of the limit of human knowledge, mm -hmm. that impossible frontier between earth and heaven. And, you know, also that line, that horizon line at sea, you know, where sailors can't use, if they can't see the horizon, they can't use the sea. So that's when they start moving into the stars and everything. But that amazing line when the sea and the sky are totally blended, you know, that is amazing, mm. amazing moment. The limit. I, um, I've been, I'm uh, being, I'm being asked to remind our viewers what we're doing because people are joining us because we have kept uh, the doors open so people can join us throughout the event come and go um come and write a poem and go and have you know dinner and come back um <laughs> so just to say that we are writing a group poem a communal poem around the, the questions of night we're following the uh changing of the lights and the changing of our thoughts as we are following through the street firelight that lead into deep night um, we are five poets, uh, are we five? We are five, yeah. Writing, uh, and you will be able to see our faces and our names as we go. And we are organized according to five sections of the moving into night and then each a section, we write each a section moving between tercets and couplets. And please do share on the uh, flash tag night and refuge uh, for those of you who feel compelled to do so, join the conversation. And I find that I am, I am doing so much of this um, talking and sharing that I am not, I, mm. I'm not, I mean, my, my, my poems, are, my lines are going to be, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, you know. <laughs> it's very difficult to be doing sharing, reading wonderful hashtag poems, looking at your lines, listening to the conversation and writing decent lines. So uh, I'm not checking out, but I'm just saying. So I, I wrote my, my <laughs> sorry. Sorry, yeah, I'm just going to say, I'm going to stop my video, but I'm still here because I need to move my phone around to plug it okay. in and I'll be sitting in an unpleasant location 
which will make the filmmakers quite unhappy, but I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. We can see you. Um, whose line was this? Uh, so I wrote uh, my three lines and uh, I was thinking about birds and, and what uh, Vani was saying. And um, uh, although we don't have bluebirds here in the UK, uh, we do have them in, in South America. And I was thinking about birds bringing news um, about the lockdown. And so mm. bluebird comes, he brings news, it'll soon be over. Look, there, he hides by the June berry, waits for me to go out into the night. Look at his ruby eyes, how like earth inside. So I have to say you're starting to cheat a little bit, Leah, because these are very long lines with many <laughs> sections and many sub phrases. And I would say that's nearly three tersets. Mm. It's a beautiful line, but... Uh, quite yeah, long. <laughs> quite long. <laughs> yeah. However, that's, that's so great because mine is about to arrive in five minutes. So, uh, and it's, mm. let me see. I am writing a couplet. It's really good. Please, it's please keep on um, sharing because I am mm. literally going to be, I think it's my turn. Earth's insides is a great phrase because mm. it's kind of simultaneously beautiful and slightly grotesque because mm. the idea of insides. Mm. Mm. Right by the Junebury. Do, does the Junebury have a particular significance? Um, it's a tree that uh, I have here in Deal. I planted it, and 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 birds love love um, this tree. It has these tiny uh, berries, um, and it's actually the, the tree is from Canada. Um, but it's, it's such a wonderful tree because in autumn the the berries get really bright red, like almost like fluorescent, like wonderful, really wonderful thing to see, and and birds get really attracted by by this kind of um, by the colour. So it's almost like they immediately get this um, message that they're good and tasty and, and so, so um, yeah. And I like the fact that they, they, yeah, they call it Juneberry because of course, yeah, in June is when, um, when you get the uh, start, you, get, you start with the berries. Um, so yeah, and the ruby eyes, you know, sort of, yeah, it's, it's a sort of, yeah, comment on, on that as well. So what, what colour are the June berries? Sorry, I mean, it's... Like ru ru ruby. No, they're ruby yeah, colour. They are ruby, ruby colour. Color. Yeah, see. ruby colour. Yeah. Okay. Um. Am I doing a couplet? Yes. That's my couplet. Let's get lost. Inside out, find me. And we are now at the end of the astronomical twilight. Oh, yeah. Some lines come in. Can we get the title of these books? <laughs> well, I have no idea. Uh, Mary Maria, I wish I could, but I think we are gonna have to speak them clearer uh, because we don't keep a reference of those. So. As of now, if you can keep, you know, we repeat the name of the author and perhaps the title of the book. Um, another one from Vera Linda, night lets you get a gate, catch a gate, even though it gets you only through words, even though there is no one between letters. Silent music. The sea hides its murmurous melodies, lit from exiting, forgetting. I remember what didn't quite pass inventing my consciousness as I fall. Very nice connections here with our conversation. Or Chitini, the sea, oh, we've, we've, we've said that, but there was one I know from Cherry Smith that has suddenly disappeared. So, there's quite a lot of them coming in. So I apologize for not seeing them. Please keep sending them on hashtag night and refuge. Chris Barras, shadows lengthening towards the incoming tide, squeezing light into dark. Mm. 
now we are moving into night this is ominous it's not night at all here in norway in fact i have the sun bright in my face and it <laughs> is here it is uh, <clears throat> quarter to 9 p.m in england night would start at this on on the, at this time of year now basically um at midnight no at 2353 at 2353 and it finishes at 204 it lasts for about 3 hours i think i need to, i need to do one more in the oh i'm so sorry astronomical twilight absolutely first. thank you so much the final sorry about that just before the yeah absolutely yeah, okay. To keep us lifted then, or either that, or that we go further down, or that you... How are we doing? We're getting, it's getting stuck in. I think this is going pretty well. Mm. Misha, you had promised some sci-fi and uh, mm -hmm. pop culture. <laughs> Well, I was just thinking, I just read this amazing um, trilogy by N.K. Jemisin called the Broken Earth Trilogy. And um, she, the Earth's insides actually play a very significant part. <laughs> but, so oh, it's okay. me if you think of that. But it's really, it's really amazing. And there's a, like, there is a sort of, um, like a kind of, uh, what's the word? Like a, the viv a vivisection of the Earth like a dissection while it's still living and it's like um which is what really happens with fracking and so on but it's mm. something uh yeah i really recommend those novels if anyone's up for some fantasy sci-fi about race and ecology <laughs> and what was her name nk jemison mk jemison broken earth trilogy yeah yeah because we haven't really gone into you know what i think preoccupies us so much as well mm -hmm. is the basically this big environmental time that we are sort of witnessing but we are sort of stuck on the human side of that so in a way it's the completion of hu the human work is that we are like completely separate from it mm -hmm. um what are your how are you how are you how are you thinking about that in relation to the in fact the imagination of separation that we are actually you know also going through at the moment aren't we not just human separation but much more deeply a sort of it seems yeah confrontation with a separation that's been so much part of um, western civilization and which is sort of the duality mm -hmm. applications of it that it seems to be a complete circle now with and so when you mention the fracking and this mm -hmm. explosion yeah, of the there's, core. there's some quite strange you know quite troubling balancing of accounts that seems to be going on between like as if humans are separate from the earth and from the ecosystem and the, you know like this stuff about like oh during the lockdown earth is recovering and healing and at, but what at you know at this particular expense and there's i find there's some quite strange um quite strange discourses about this about uh, which i find yeah i find very troubling but also you know uh, there are things there to listen to of course um but there are yeah I don't know if, what, if anyone else has heard about those types of these messages and had any thoughts about those. I've been really interested, I mean, following some people who've been mocking them correctly. Uh, and I, I would name names, but a very favorite uh, Northern Irish poet of mine posted a picture of pterodactyls sighted over in Yorkshire as, as nature's healing. <laughs> <laughs> I think nature is a dirty word and, and yeah. so is human. Yeah. Well, that's an it's an illusion of superiority yeah. and an abdication of responsibility at the same time to separate yeah. nature and human from the created world Absolutely. as if there could be separation. Yeah. And Absolutely. with the idea of nature healing itself, uh, it's a ridiculous kind of veil over an attempt to guilt people as individuals uh, rather than address structural inequalities and abominable behaviors yeah. because if you look for example at the amount of pollution that has been reduced by people not flying on individual flights that's very very little that there are all sorts of other things that need to be done and all other sorts of uses of aviation which need to be cut. It isn't people going to Ibiza. It isn't even the people who are lawyers and businessmen flying between London and Glasgow every day. It's much bigger than that. 
and, and it, it is not dependent on individual people doing good things and feeling nice or stopping doing nice things and feeling good. Yeah. Also, perhaps the, the, the political horrors of the, you know, taking on the, um, the uh, existing of this lockdown, this virus circulating to just confirm issues of poverty, just to, again, abdicating on the social level, the responsibility for poverty, for uh, social divisions, again, on this notion of the confinement and lockdown, you know, and I think there's been a lot of that in relation to hospitals and hospital care, you know, and again, an abdication, it seems, you know, of, of, the, of the way all this is so much to do with, with the uh, in deep inequality um, anyway, way before the virus sort of gets involved. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is the lack of uh, information sharing, the lack of coordinated global policy, and the absence of fair media reporting. So you don't see any reporting very much of the USA intercepting in an act of piracy, the yeah. personal protective equipment destined for Barbados. Uh, you don't see reports on the Cuban doctors helping in Trinidad. Uh, you don't see reports in East Asian countries uh, reducing uh, their infection rates. Yeah, it, absolutely. It, it, yeah, when uh, it, what it, it highlights invisibilization. Yes. It isn't just that the virus is invisible, but what's yes. being highlighted is the invisibilization of global interconnectedness. Yes. Uh, I would recommend Global Voices as a really, I don't know if you read it, the Global Voices is a uh, very much grassroots, it started as a very much grassroots uh, local journalist writing in. Uh, and now it's professionalized itself more and more, but it's everywhere. It does simultaneous translations. It is, it's thoroughly international and it, it will provide with some of the news that we need because they help us want to organize and find ways ourselves of joining in, if you like, into more so, and, and ways of looking for solutions to this. So I would recommend Global Voices, just one of the outlets that definitely, you know, would highlight some of the productive actions that you're describing here and not make us feel so powerless, part of this massive machine that we can't, you know. And that's why I think, to go back to the question of poetry, which is that very sort of small, um, uh, individualized sort of practice, but here looking at it as a shared idea, you know, the way things are changed potentially in, in practices, you know, in, in these situations of emergency and even now receiving all these lines from poets that are listening in, you know, and I think these are the news that, that we definitely also want to share. In. I mean, the fact that- Yeah, absolutely, we endorse that. Uh, in fact, I think it's the managing director of Global Voices, Georgia Popplewell, who's a Trinidadian, uh, yeah. who also always reports on and supports our local literary festival, the Bocas Lit Fest. Uh, and and uh, in people like her, you can see culture and responsibility are part of the fabric of life. They're mm. just interwoven, they're inextricable. So I think Global Voices is brilliant in terms of information mm. and as, as a base for action and solidarity. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, I don't know who's composing. Will is composing. Let me read a few more that are coming in from Tanzin's Goat, Night, This Tree, This Try, Air About Us, We Assume We Must, so here there's a lot of respellings, um, so I can only read them as I see them. We must assume the desiring no lemon, but long delayed stars. Amy Evans Bauer, the archer and the archer in visible sea shelf rendered legible at 18 degrees. Murderous tilt of the eye, CCTV, CSEA, TV, let them eat the kitchen sink as seabed workers work their night, untouchable. If you all start to develop all these interesting type, you know, ways of typing your poems, um, I'm, <laughs> it's going to mean that I have to develop a whole complicated or complex way of reading, which I do with pleasure, but just, you know. From Cherry Smith, mine dulls you smoke ray, nothing burning but my air, night writes to itself. Mary Maria Casoli, I love the entrance of the night blue bird, the addition of birds that fly throughout the night. So grateful for friends like Cherry and others writing in. Thank you. And for those of you joining us, we are sharing a poem about night and refuge, discussing different uh, questions around the falling of the night 
and what refuge might mean in relation to that, what refuge might mean in relation to home. And do join us on hashtag night and refuge with your thoughts, comments, or poems. Um, we now are, who's, who's, um, well, I just, I just wrote mine. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, so we are closing Astronomical Twilight with Will's first set. Would you like to read it? Okay. Landing in the West End, midnight bus falls backpack on lap like many others. I, I was, for me, it's like, oh, okay, so we're not only landing, but also landing, living in Leo, you know, I've, landing in a reality that I know so well that I don't share at the moment. And suddenly there was that sense of, oh, this is a really like a daily life. I know it so well, you know, it's, mm -hmm. and I'm not in it and we're not part of it, you know, and, and it, it just sets up all those uh, associations with types of living that we are or not, we are or are not uh, being able to share in. That's just a very personal response, but the, the backpack on lap, like many mm. others, I thought was a very moving line. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah. It's, quite, it's funny because that, that we, we can all sort of remember public transport, for example, or like, oh, the bus journey, seeing friends, but these tiny little things like a backpack on my lap, like <laughs> it's like just perfectly captured, like these yeah. details of everyday life that we are, are quite foreign at the moment. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I was also just remembering, I, I used to work at this uh, call center on the weekends and I worked uh, either the, uh, the very early morning or the very late shift. So I was always going against the flow of people. Um, and so when I'd be going home at night, just after my shift finished, just before midnight, I'd off, it would be all the people coming out or already on a, like a big night in central London. And then there'd be all the others who had their like backpacks who were like going to work, a lot of people starting work night shifts or going home and I think I hadn't really noticed it I hadn't, you don't really clock it unless you're kind of mm. one of those in one of those groups Absolutely. Really. Mm. I used to work in nightclubs and it's the same where you have that weird thing on your face in fact on your face again your skin just like a jet lag when you sort of are about to when you see the the the, the, the night when you go home and you see people that are actually going to work in a different capacity. There's something mm. about the skin, the skin of the night worker, the skin of me coming home, having uh, mm. had a sort of late night shift. And, you know, there's mm. definitely something to do with the, and the glassiness actually that we perceive as well, I think, you know, like mm. you can feel that. It's so different from feeling so clean and washed and ready to go from actually coming home at the other end with, uh, you know, cigarette smoke and everything over. Mm. You know. It's also really interesting that uh, it's an urban night uh, in, in a city with public transport uh, mm -hmm. and the midnight bus pulls backpack on lap uh, because when I've lived semi-rurally there would be that thing of missing the last bus from the nearest uh, small town, mm. the desperation not to miss the last bus which might be at a stupid time like 7pm uh, yeah. otherwise yeah. you'd be stranded. Uh, or you can be on a very small island off the coast of Scotland or somewhere and there might be a ferry out on a Monday and a ferry back on a Wednesday. Mm. And uh, so there's a different quality when the night falls uh, because the night means you're geographically cut off in a different way. But even between cities, recently I was trying to, well not that recently, just before everything changed in a visible way, though of course the change was happening. I was trying to get from Manchester to Gatwick in early March and I found to my horror there's actually no rail transport link from Manchester to Gatwick running throughout the night. You're either supposed to overnight somewhere or you're supposed to go by car, which is ridiculous. I mean, you can take an overnight bus, it takes hours and hours, but you would imagine between a great city of the north and the supposed airport serving a capital of the south, that, that there would be night links, uh, but there isn't joined up transport even between cities. Uh, and to, to start mapping the night, uh, if mm. you are a commuter or precarious worker with several different contracts, mm. to map the night by the transport provided, mm. the absence mm. of having a car or mm. private jet, uh, mm. is to have a very strange and gappy map. Mm. It's it also has that, map no, be that, stranded, that, stranded at certain hours. Yeah, no, I was going to say that there's also this. Um, idea um, about the midnight bus and public transport has been sort of the refuge 
uh, a place of um, that you go uh, for, for safety if you want to get from one place to the other. But now with the coronavirus, public transport meaning a place where you might get infected because there's so many people um, you know, crammed into these spaces. So the, the idea of refuge um, is, is kind of lost or gone. Um, you have to take the public transport, but um, you might get infected or so, yeah, it'd be really interesting. I'm just gonna read you a few uh, things that have come in and then we're moving into night, actually. We have now finished our journeying through the twilight and we are entering the night. But let me read you, as we do, let me read you a few things that have come in from Davinia Hamilton, a link between humans imagining themselves separate from nature, so that picks up on our conversation earlier, and the imagined separation of the mind from body. Mm -hmm. uh, ties quite nicely with the early idea of one space as possession, but also obviously the duality or this is dualism. Amy Evans, let's get lost, find out. <laughs> so hang on, because this is where I have to sort of practice again how I would read the sounds. So let's get lost, find out, yeah, I would say it, yeah, our, yeah, our, your, yeah, our, my inside, but lured lines on wet sheets. Julie Mac Elhone, astronomical twilight, over the edge that never ends. There is no snapback with a hyphen of light unless mirrored. Be mine, I'll be yours. And orchid, uh, Tierney, the intestinal loves of birds, falsely equates molecular intimacies with juicy berries. <laughs> Thank you again, all of you. Please keep on writing as we're moving into the night. Um, we are on hashtag night and refuge and we are writing here uh, a poem in five voices uh, separated across the five stages of the night and we're just moving into the night now. I believe the first tercet is from Nisha and let me put the timer on because I have no idea where we are time wise. We've got about 30 minutes per stanza and I think it's been going quite well, apart from the fact that my stopwatch just stopped uh, <laughs> at the one just previous, so I have no idea where we are in time, but I will be told, I'm sure, by SMS if we are, if we're not. We do want to do a full reading of where we are mm -hmm. later on and perhaps see if we have time for some refrains, um, but we'll see. So, night. Does that feel different? We're moving away from... Yes, you did. Fantastic. I'm just okay. Great. Nisha, would you like to read it? Yeah. Um, so this is just um, following on from these like these conversations about yes, these these false distinctions between nature and humans or um, and I've been reading a lot of um, been, well, not a lot. I've been trying to read some books about physics. And one of the things I find really fascinating is about the limits of language for describing certain concepts. And especially when we get into four dimensional space and time that we don't have the language to understand, to kind of describe or comprehend that. And, um, and I feel like that that's, that's, that's something to do with too, how we don't really have, we have like, um, yeah, we don't have words to probably like try to con um, conceptualize all of the interconnections and the kind of ripples and the vibrations between us, everything that lives and doesn't live on the planet and in the in this um, in space. So anyway, but then what I find really interesting too is in in sun so I often work with the Sanskrit English dictionary, and there are many very specific words for astronomical events, and so there was uh, so my night was like the first night um following twilight and there is a specific word for that um and for many other phases of night um it's it's a compound word so i kind of illustrated the the compound but it is it is one word um okay who is awake an indeclinable word for a web take upa purva ratram eyeballs the safety net it's corruptly given. Night finds us differently. Mm. 
I guess it was also about this question of like refuge coming back to refuge and like is language mm -hmm. language as a home well very famously explored by Vani <laughs> and very wonderfully explored by Vani in Retros of Expatriation language as a home but um also how language can be uh, and and uh, something that I feel as as someone who is was brought up in a household a multilingual household but like will only taught to speak English and feeling that English is not a safe home for me to live in to work in to speak in but it is my it is my mother tongue I, um so there's some there's this very like conflicted and sort of quite treacherous relationship there um yeah and is that why you bring in Sanskrit I mean Sanskrit as a classical language rather than a vehicular or vernacular language or explain that well i think that uh, there are different reasons but i think that so my my family is hindi, uh, hindi speaking um and i think that uh, so uh, you know after many failed attempts to learn hindi as a child and teenager and then and to just um for whatever various reasons not managing to learn just although my parents and my extended family speak um it felt like if i it felt like just ooh, i might as well acknowledge the this artifice when sanskrit is the most artificial <laughs> of of um languages like it's the name itself means perfectly crafted perfectly formed mm. so i just thought like if i'm going to be working with another language which i felt very desperate to do um i can't pretend it comes naturally i can't pretend i can't make some claim to mother tongues or natural multilingualism or any you know linguistic roots so i'm going to just manifest the artifice through this use of sanskrit and uh, yeah it's a fascinating language to work Story, with yeah foundational of course yeah. culturally as yeah. well so it is a yeah very interesting choice philosophically yeah, really... as well oh sorry no go on no, no, I was just going to say that Vivek Narayanan, N-A-R-A-Y-A-N-A-N, -A -A Vivek Narayanan, very kindly did an online interview for the Compass magazine, where he was talking about his ongoing translation or innovative avant-garde response to the Ramayan, mm -hmm. and he was talking mm -hmm. about Sanskrit as a language of privilege and mm -hmm. oppression, and uh, it's... Uh, severance from its multiple folkloric reflexes and i was thinking nisha mm, about my own uh, sort of partial relationship to sanskrit uh, which i apprehend in two ways uh, one uh, as indeed uh, the patriarchal and oppressive language uh, of a really violent hierarchical system and on the other hand the language organized by grammarians uh, and uh, pertaining to a philosophy of language which does not uh, only limit itself to the quantitative and denotative, uh, but looks at the actual vibration of the correctly pronounced pure mm. syllables uh, as being in, in tune with the universe. Uh, yes. So in tune with the cosmic vibration of the yes. dance of energy in the universe, uh, irrespective of your intention. So I mean, you might be feeling really good and hippy dippy and you might have a lotus flower in your hair and be wearing yellow and white and not have touched flesh for 10 years. Uh, but if you pronounce the syllable incorrectly, it has no effective power. Yeah. It's yes. just kind of weird, mad physics of, of vibration. It is extraordinary. It is very fun. I've, I've, worked, I've been looking quite a lot at, at questions of mantras, again, for this idea of vibrational, vibrational language be in performance. And certainly this whole idea of the root seed that, again, has a, a, you know, an exact mimological sort of relation with the sounds in the earth that it creates or in the you know in the in the elements I, it's, I, it's a fascinating yeah, idea of the, the vibration which is created by the sound of language and then that philosophy of an absolute connection yeah, yeah but i think it's, that kind of ancient, hermeticism, yeah. yeah the hermeticism the absolute power exactly. and the elaboration can't really be be divorced from the hierarchical nature yeah. of the systems in, in which uh, it evolved. Absolutely. So, I think that's such an interesting point, Vani, to bring up the, this whole idea of the hierarchy of knowledge as well in, in, in that classical culture or in that classical language. 
but I, I feel too, just like going on from that, 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 that the, the sense of the corruption of using that language or, or imitating it or anything, because exactly, it's quite interesting to put together, Vani, you're like the dichotomy of the, uh, it's a language of oppression and like very brutal enforcement of hierarchy in terms of the caste system. And it's also a language that um, sort of is meant to be vibrate and kind of in, uh, attune the speaker to the cosmos. And what does it mean to speak it correctly then? You are attuning yourself also to these hierarchies, these paradynamics, these violences. Um, it, there's, it brings up complicity in a really um, fascinating way that, yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of um, Rosemary Waldo in a very different way. You know, the way poets also, very much like you, uh, Nisha, using grammars or using, um, glossaries or you know in as a way of conducting your imagination as well you know you ground it you deepen it and then it also sort of allows it to flourish differently and it reminds me of grammars like there's a wonderful french poet at the moment called benedict Villegrain, and she's working with the tibetan grammar so she publishes this tiny little flyer of poems and then e each little flyer is made of one of the letters of the tibetan alphabet and through that grammar she examines the tibetan language and her relation to it as a as a French poet, or the work of Rosemary Waldrop, The Key to the Invention of America, in which she took, she, she a German speaker arriving in America, and who took in, uh, in the Rhode Island um, territories, and took a grammar and a glossary that had been written by Roger Williams around, a, you know, um, Native Americans uh, from the Narragansett tribe with the Narragansett language, and the way she wove uh, her whole sense of, first of all, I think the disappearance, decimation of that population with that first attempt um, to try and understand uh, the, the, you know, if you like, the languages that were already there and then her arrival as a German European in the, you know, uh, after the Second World War. So I think there again, the, um, the, the connection between using these grammars as points of power or as empowerment or disempowerment, I think is really quite interesting. But that's not necessarily what I see in your in your poetry, actually. But I do love the the, the fact that I hadn't thought about so much of the pointing to the, the, the you know that you have the vibrational philosophy, the cosmology of the language, and and it is based on these power dynamics that it was so that are so exclusive. And so I just uh, wrote my couplet, and I wrote. These lines, uh, thinking about uh, um, my telescope and pointing rather than to the night, to the my room, to m m my objects, the things that kind of surround me, and especially now during lockdown, where we are surrounded by all these things. Um, so, and also this idea sometimes when I go to bed and and everything is dark. And I sometimes think about a book or a object in the house um, lying there in the darkness and sort of thinking that they have a, an inner light, that they are sort of luminous and they sort of, they have this life on their own. So I just live among luminous shapes, my shoes, cap, and old telescope. A bit like um, um, Will's line about the backpack. There's something, I have to say, nearly comforting, you know, to find in and out of these sections, we find these very direct, intimate connections with objects or with habits or, and it's very, it's, I don't know, it sort of carves much more intimate roots through, you know, the way we are working this, this poem. It's, 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 uh, it's nearly reassuring. It's like a comforting sort of directness, uh, I find, in, in some of these lines. So if Who's you next? are... Is it, is it you next, Caroline? Yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It is me. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I should have given me one liners actually, because uh, I have too much to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see. So, uh, we also have some things coming in. 
Oh, Orchid asking, is language a shelter? That could be a really interesting to pursue. We just talked about Sanskrit, which to power dynamics and, and other grammars uh, for contemporary poets. So is language a shelter, a means to obtain retreat, hesitation or punishment from Orchid Tierney? I think very interesting uh, question. My tongue is long for dialect, a weed in the crack. But is language a shelter? I leave you with that. Uh, I think this is such a rich and of course, important point uh, for poetry. I, um, I was thinking, well, well, you were talking about um, Sanskrit and the kind of grammar of power. <clears throat> I guess because I'm, I was thinking about my own relationship to English and what, and, and the kind of, what I often think of as the like the syntax of power. Um, I have a friend who's who's reading the King James Bible from the start, and I think mm -hmm. I often, and it's a, a source that I often go back to because I, I I don't know, partly because I was raised Catholic, I went to a Catholic primary school, so I think it's like buzzing around somewhere. But also, I love seventeenth-century poetry. That was like some of the first poetry that got me writing, and I think there's something when I I often find when I try and um, express something, and I'm looking for a sense of, of kind of rightness or conclusiveness, I'll lean on this kind of syntax, which is, which goes back to the 17th century into King James. And it also made me think of um, Denise Riley and I would like the, and the way that her idea of the lyric and the lyric is something which is always querying and arguing with that lineage and that syntax. And I was thinking particularly of this poem, Summer, which ends, moon, it's pre-industrial light. What though the dark, the cumber, Glow worm, say to her. Mm. But that particular phrase, what though the dark, the cumber, <laughs> is, is just, I think it's just, <laughs> it's just really amazing. Mm. And, but it, it's like, I, it's, it's so close to, it, I, I don't know if it is like, it's, it's something kind of parodic, but also not, yeah. And that use of cumber and glow worm. Yeah, do you have any, do you have any, does anyone have any thoughts? I wonder. Because I think of that in your, in terms of your work, Barney, as well, the way you're, you're bringing that, that Jamesian syntax as well, and this kind of, and you're both using the syntax of power in the way that is, but also slightly ironising it, sort of parodying it at the same time. No, it wouldn't have been the King James for me, it would have been the Douay version, and oh, yeah. I've, I've uh, left behind the Douay version and have been trying to read the new revised whatever it is thing which is available online and very very good. I, I do think the King James Bible needs to be read though if one is to grasp uh, literature in English is uh, from you know the 1600s onwards. It, it's so much in the language. You see it in a writer like Thomas Hardy but you also see it permeating even courts of law and it permeates Sunday schools and it's, it does a very odd thing in terms of the languages that are available in class terms, uh, because people who might be unfairly deprived educationally in other ways, uh, you will hear having access to elaborated language. Uh, they used to hear this in one particular street I lived on, uh, where there was a good deal of domestic violence, uh, and people would uh, describe to policemen what they were doing. Uh, in this very weird compound of an extremely colloquial English and a very elaborated English borrowed from the King James Bible and from the Magistrates Court. So, I mean, the grammar of power, I think, is messy and fragmented in terms of who accesses it and how one can self-describe via that grammar or rather that lexicon. Mm. I love the um, the the pre-industrial moon as well in the that Denise Riley, um, like the sense that the moon that existed before the industrial revolution is lost to us. <laughs> so like just adding on these new layers of nostalgia um, to the moon, and also I like I 
yeah um like which moon do we have now we don't have the same one they had then um yeah but that's really of virginia wolf wasn't it virginia wolf writing on christina rossetti and how we can't have hearts like singing birds any longer <laughs> Is Will frozen? I like the littleness oh, yeah. of the glow worm. It reminds me of the match burning in the crocus. I mean, the smallness of the glow worm and also its kind of invertebrate frailty, which is so different from grand poetic luminary stars. I've finished. Uh, my tercet for night, picking up, um, picking up on uh, Leah's line actually on on the atmosphere there. I think I sense something else, blindsided, feeling away, just can't be sure, lost fitting. Mm. And this, I like, quite frankly, is actually me. Uh, there is there is this absolutely wonderful sense of when the you know the turning of the night uh, when it goes so dark that you really can't see your your hand in front of you. It's quite a rare it's quite a rare feeling now. Um, at least at least certainly in the latitudes where I live and in the latitudes in England, it's very rare. It's something that you would find more in uh, you know uh, rural conditions and. But there is that sense of the losing the footing, which I connected a little bit to this idea of the, you know, the, um, the familiarity of the object you were describing, uh, Leo, and the sense of comfort that that was providing. Here, there mm. is a sense that somehow with night, things do take on other characters, other, you know, they lose, they even, they even lose their luminosity. Um, mm. So, but this is more like a, a thought process as part of that. Mm. Caroline, are you imagining, I don't mean this uh, as, as a, a personal question about you yourself, but is the person in the stanza walking on a deserted road? Are they walking alone in a place with others whom they don't know? Or is there potentially a companion or companionable stranger who would catch them as they stumble? What, it, what's the sense of plurality or isolation in that night of unseeing and stumbling? Actually, it's Hello. funny because I, I write these lines very much in that very social space we occupy. And so the way I access this idea of losing footing and feeling the absolute darkness of night, of a rural night, is actually something I'm... I'm um, I'm accessing more like the solitary aspect of the absolute dark, I think. But because of the way we are um, uh, generating these lines at the moment, I perceive our night as pretty social. But the way that line functions, it functions through memories of solitariness. You know, not necessarily, not necessarily um, negative because there's no value to them. It's the action of stumbling. Uh, it does. It's not a value. Um, but it, I see it as a solitary. Thing that I perceive our night in a much more sociable way. So it's a way I, I add that solitary stumbling into it rather than rather than it being separate from, from that. Thank you. The memory of solitariness is really beautiful. It's also making me think of Inish Boffin, uh, the westernmost island off the coast of Ireland, uh, where normally I would be thinking of heading at the end of May every year. Mm. And, and now I hope people are leaving the little islands alone uh, during mm. this time of plague but uh, the streets there or the street there isn't lit but you can hear people walking to and from late night uh, acoustic music events mm. so you hear voices along the road but you can't see anybody and your friends recognize you by voice by voice or cross distance and then you only very gradually catch up as a kind of warm and moving body and even then you don't really see each other which is rather beautiful some lines from vera linder let's look for ghosts 
so they can tell us about the past moons certainly moving into night and into the past people moving past in the dark sarada which languages do you dream in which languages do you dream in that might be a question that you can that some of you might feel like answering which languages do you dream in and do you dream do you do, does your poetry have a type of dream language apart from your skills apart from the technical set of it but do you perceive it as occupying a type of a type of space i've had three really disconcerting experiences with dream languages uh, one is uh, and i wrote about this in my first book no traveler returns uh, i dreamt about uh, a girl with a swan cradle under either arm uh, and she was speaking and writing on a blackboard uh, in a language which in the dream i understood to be ancient greek but i don't know ancient greek beyond what i needed for pure maths uh, so that was bizarre and I'm sure a lot of people have dreamt languages they don't know. Then the second thing is I have a very deep affective layer of French, even though I don't necessarily use French in the everyday, nor would I describe myself as ordinarily fluent necessarily. And so frequently in heightened emotional dreams, those dreams will be in French, not in English. But then the last thing was this morning I was trying, well, not this morning, I've been waking up just before 2 a.m and uh, this is partly to tune into Blackfriars Cambridge Lords which is very beautifully sung on Radio Maria England and you don't have to be religious to listen but uh, it's also because the teaching day at the University of York uh, begins around May 5 a.m and I like a little time to put my head together first uh, so I was waking up really early this morning or, or you know late in the night whatever you want to call just before 2 a.m mm -hmm. uh, and I was dreaming of talking to somebody who kept using Latin and I do know a few phrases of Latin, but I mean, Latin was not taught anymore in schools in Trinidad after it was nationalized. My mother did Latin when, when she was at school in Trinidad and schools were not nationalized then. And it was this really, really strange conversation with somebody giving me gratuitous creative writing advice, peppered with these Latin phrases. And I woke up feeling very confused. <laughs> mm -hmm. You had an Anno experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were telling me to write all about the evening star yeah. and only about the evening <laughs> star. They're telling me what to write about in the session today. Yeah. All right. That's pretty good. <laughs> you know, I, I used to. Go on, Leo. <laughs> no, no, I, I was going to say that I used to uh, dream in Spanish, mostly in Spanish. But the more I write in English, especially if the more I write about my past or past memories or about, you know, my mother or. Uh, I, I now I, I dream in English. I dream that I speak English with my mum, um, and I describe her in English in my dreams. It's very strange. Um, so, yeah. So I'm, I'm dreaming less and less in Spanish. Um, but when, when you go back to Argentina, the Spanish comes back. The yeah, dream comes, comes back. back in Spanish. Yes, yes, that's, yes, that's right. Isn't that yeah. weird? It's nearly yes, it's very of, strange. Yeah, it's this sort of brain function of. Uh, Nearly the brain going, well, I don't need, you know, I actually need to be quite fluent in English while I'm here. And then I need to be back into my other fluency when I'm over there. You know, like the yes, brain yes. literally just saying, okay, that can become a sort of buried or a sort of, I don't know which type of memory it is, but you know, another type of, of, of memory. Yeah, it's very yeah, interesting. Yeah, mm, yeah very you're right. Interesting. <clears throat> I this just, was amazing phrase, and, sorry, sorry, Will. Oh, no, no, go. go. No, 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 I had a Spanish Go question on. for Leo, which is oh, a book has yeah. poem, but I can't remember which one, but he uses an amazing phrase, la noche lateral. And I wondered what sense la, or what, what resonance la noche lateral might have in Spanish or Argentinian poetry of the night, mm, or if it's just a book mm. here, the sort of labyrinthine night. Yeah, I can't remember specifically that uh, poem by Borges, but um, yeah, he. La noche, la noche lateral. That's that's a wonderful, a wonderful line. Um, he, I, 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 I literally kept reading Borges today and and the last few few days. I I I found this um, book called um, Poems of the Night, uh, and there are all these um, um, poems and meditations about night and night related themes uh, by Borges. Some because he he ended up being completely blind, but um, mostly because he was interested in, in the metaphysical concept of night. Um, so there's lots of 
uh, images of um, mirrors and, and, as you say, labyrinths, um, sort of metaphors for, for, for night. Um, and, and it's just wonderful, it's wonderful. And, and also the quality of light and specifically from uh, um, dawn, uh, dusk, um, atardecer, uh, amanecer, so the, that those crucial moments for him. Um, um, so yes, it's really, really wonderful. I, I didn't know that there was this kind of book specifically on, on night, but he wrote so many, so many poems related to night and, and the quality of, of, of light. And, and so, mm. Mm. Yeah, the the, I had so, sorry, I had so rudely interrupted. No, 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 no. Oh, <laughs> yes. And also we have a portrait that has arrived. Is that the final? No, that's Will's, that's Will's couplet, is it? Yes. And then, <clears throat> and then Varney's will be the final. Fantastic. Tercet. Yeah. Will, would you read it? Okay. But sense whether felt uncambered is lyric thinking, no. Mm. Oh, nice. Yeah. Mm. The cambered was a kind of meant to be a link back to the, the lens or the idea yes. of light bending. I wonder, yes. So, I like the idea of the, the lyric thinking as negative or as negative thinking potentially. I don't know, but you know, that's a little bit how I'm, how I'm looking at it in relation to your, to your line. But is this yeah. Vani's line? Looks like it, yeah. yes, yes, and I'm dedicating that one to Father Angela over in Kings Lynn, who's been tweeting a lot to me about dancing. Great, mm. excellent. She's been tweeting while we're talking. <laughs> no, I, I can't see it with a screen. I've fantastic. just had a series of dancing tweets with her. Dancing tweets, fantastic. Can you read your line? Yeah, it actually enjambes with Will's line to produce a creative ambiguity. Yeah. No. Darkness begins under the sun, you say, but long ago I shut my eyes and began the no-touch dancing. Mm. Mm. So that's a beautiful, beautiful way of closing on night, uh, this idea of dancing. Uh, beautiful. Mm. Let me read you a few that have come in from Sharon Mesmer, Night Lexicon. The declension of the sun by way of inflection carries syllables of earth. Lavinia Hamilton, the night langage, la langue, that must be Lacanian, tongues the cavity, ecstatically engage yeah, to pluck meaning from a permanent firmament. I'll read that again because I was sort of nodding. The night language, the night langage, la langue, tongues the cavity, ecstatically engage to pluck meaning from a permanent firmament, firmament. Thank you again so much for all of you for sending in your, your poems, your comments. We are on hashtag night and refuge and we, are, we have finished our fourth uh, stanza. We are deep into the night. Um, the night actually continues for another at least hour. Uh, so it is the longest of our, it should be the longest. I should have doubled everybody up, but then, you know, we wouldn't have time for that. Um, and then the idea is that, are we then moving? It's still deep night because it is, at that time, it is, let me see them. Something like, I wrote it down in our, Sorry about all this rustling. So we are starting, to, yes, you see it's only 2 a.m. So it's still very dark, astronomical, deep night towards the dawn. It is, it is that moment of rotation. But of course, we've been doing a lot of that in the way we've been um, thinking and writing about night light and all those different sort of um, scintillations in between. Now, uh, I'm being reminded that, um, it is 8.25, so if we want to do an astronomical move towards dawn and read the poems and think about the refrains, um, we don't have time for a long astronomical move towards the dawn. I wonder, 
I sort of love the, aha, great. Someone has started on it. I suggest we yeah. go as far as we can uh, into the astronomical move and then we leave a bit of time to mm -hmm. perhaps look at each our contributions uh, if mm -hmm. we want, but then we'll do a reading. I'll, I'll read a few more contributions and then we'll do a reading of what we have managed to uh, assemble. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be ideal if we managed to discuss some of the refrains since we still have a bit of time, but let's look at the astronomical um, time. So this is Leo, your first person. Yeah, so I was thinking today that actually I was born in astron astronomical twilight in Great. Argentina, uh, in the southern hemisphere. That means, um, yeah, I was thinking about refuge and home and, and where your heart is and where your home is. Um, so this is a haiku. I was born at night in the southern hemisphere, my heart upside down. That is a lovely finish line, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Oh dear, it's me again, hang on. <laughs> um, before I say that, we have a poem from Annie. We live among the luminous, we stardust fossils pulsing. As we jump into the void, unfix the stars into shapes of home until we are ready, love. Orchard, I dream in gestures, malevolent and benign. I dream in gestures, malevolent and benign. Sarada, the darkness of the dark amplifies the soundness of rooms. The loss of home is the loss of the familiar darkness of sounds. Thank you again, all of you, for writing in these really wonderful dives into, uh, into the night. Uh, we're on hashtag night and refuge, and it is me. I have to write uh, a couplet. <laughs> so um, I will then leave the scene and we'll just mute my. Will, uh, can I ask you about the, um, there's a line that you wrote in your notes, uh, the true self has three kinds of diseases and two uh, kinds yeah. of light. I haven't used that. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so yeah, actually I was, go on, sorry. No, no, I was going to ask you, you know, where, where does it come from and um, what's the idea behind, yeah. I was actually going to bring that up with you as well, because you said you were oh. reading haiku um, yeah. and I, was reading this um, sort of this this quite um, of its time book from the seventh, uh, the Penguin Book of Zen Poetry, which is quite mm. which is quite good. But a, a book I really really love, which I don't have here in physical form, is this book of Zen Cohen's that um, was translated by this guy called Yoel Hoffman in the early twentieth century. It was a big influence on Jung, and it's it's a series of Cohen's with you know the kind of what's the sound of one hand clapping, you know, that kind of thing, but with the answers. And so there was Ooh. apparently like a big uproar within the, the, the Zen Buddhist world when, when this was translated and published. But um, obviously they're not really answers because often, mm. there are multiple, there are often there are multiple answers, but they're amazingly, um, yeah, they're just amazingly, as, I don't know, like stimulating as, ways of re-gearing your mind so there'll be a question like this is one of the questions the true self has three kinds of disease and two kinds of light and then there'll oh, be I about see. 10 different answers mm. um which are which the so the the master the zen master will ask will say that and then the mm. student will will give a variety of answers one of which is together with the fall of night there comes the sound of wind and rain yet you cannot tell how many flowers have fallen from their trees. And often there'll be an action accompanied with that, like someone will op like open the door or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're often very like matter of fact. Sometimes the answer yeah. will be like slap the master of the face or put down the bucket or... Um, <laughs> yeah, it's true I was, because I, I, yeah. Yeah, I was reading, I was reading the, uh, the Penguin book of uh, haikus and I, I also 
found really interesting that this challenges and responses um and there's, and there's loads loads of those yeah again yeah you said, same thing um, yeah the same thing and and really fascinating almost like different answers to these kind of challenges or, or questions mm. and some in, in this book some of them are quite uh sexual there's a lot of sexual haikus or, or erotic uh, or really? really fascinating yeah like wonderful sort of um like snippets of, of um this really sort of erotic and, and sexual sort of imagery um and even some uh, drawings as well so i, mm. I highly recommend it it's, that it's sounds a great yeah a great book and it feels really important to read haiku alongside it's i mean i, I like I, I know very little but alongside a slightly broader understanding of Zen, Zen Buddhist thought, because I think when we read them in the West, we read them through the perspective of lyric poetry and we see them just as images. And, mm -hmm. but the whole point is this, this kind of the paradox, this kind of clash, this yes. irresolv this or irresol irresolvableness. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and it makes me think a lot about how there's this tendency, this drive towards resolution in lyric thinking in the way that lyric works um even when like in um you know a lot of 17th century poetry like dunn and Mar marvel you won't have you have these images which don't quite work you know like yeah. two lovers being like the points of a compass that doesn't you know it doesn't quite make sense but yeah. it's a different kind of thinking because it's working towards an argument whereas in in zen haiku there's they, they don't meet they don't connect they're just put there to induce this kind of state of, yes, which is yes, open so to, to paradox in this way, which yeah. is, and I also I also like the fact that there there were women writers um, uh, writing haikus, uh, and their perspective is is completely different, and there's a completely different sensibility, um, which makes it even richer the, the whole experience of reading all these haikus because they're mostly written a really long long time ago. Um, um, but it, yeah, I, I highly recommend reading haikus during lockdown. <laughs> mm. I think it's, it's, it's quite so enriching and yes. Yeah. Well, if we're ever in the position of being able to touch people without uh, risking killing them, then uh, do you think you might consider running a workshop or masterclass on the koans and the actions? Because that could be really interesting and I believe things like that have been tried, though notoriously perhaps with less success. <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would be incredible, yeah. I would Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. I would come and do it at York. Yes, that would be amazing. Um and I love the idea of approaching a workshop in a more ritualistic way <laughs> rather mm. than because sometimes it can feel a bit mechanical, like I'm gonna give you prompts and you're gonna get a poem, whereas <laughs> oh yeah, like you're going to ride an imaginary scooter kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> this would definitely, this would definitely change it, change things, <laughs> change the dynamic. Yeah, I mean, it could also do it like martial arts, like when you're doing an ATF style taekwondo, you, I mean, except when you're actually sparring, you would often stop just short. So maybe, maybe as, as I doubt so the coronavirus is going to lift in any serious way and as we do not want to kill each other by touching each other and indulging ourselves in our <laughs> touch, then uh, maybe we could have a, a, a masterclass with the actions but stopping short mm. of actual contact. Mm -mm. Um, I think I should, uh, because we, we're starting to run out of time a little bit, my, it's my fault of course since I'm the one uh, also holding up all the process of writing, I'm finishing here. Oh, I think um, it's a couplet, no. Yes, it's a couplet. Now in between no's, not's. Mm. This is a kind of return back to the beginning. Yes, the in, be in between, mm. in between mm. hours. And the knots as well, I like the, the idea of the keepers and yeah. Um, yeah, the knots. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Um, just feeding here, you, uh, Amy you, Evans dance, she writes a social pace, and let me see, do we have time for one more from, who else is, is it Will now, is it going to be your turn? it Will, great, yep. so while you generate that, I could read one more contribution from Julie <coughs> McElhone, night, there was a bracketing in shared spaces, those things come in the night, to mess up your syntax, together, arrange, 
I can't reduce a pile in my house made of scared objects that laugh darkly at me. To be sure, again, I live where there are not. At half the kitchen table, the bathroom, and in sleep with those I have lost. It is here only that I submit to lyrics. I will remember little of it tomorrow. We are all this darkness, you see. Some keep the lights on to make them forget. This is all. Thank you, Judy. Chat Chong, you're coming in with, just as I was putting the phone down, so darkness, a water-filled body, a water-filled body, two hyphens, a water-filled body dived into an oceanic lake puddle tucked. Oceanic lake puddle with hyphen tucked. Super great. So we are still at um, hashtag night and refuge. Uh, writing now our final stage of the night. We are in the astronomical twilight. It makes, you know, initially, this is so interesting because initially this gig was planned for a whole day and then followed by some of our conversation treated by Jamie Hamilton, who's a sun artist I work with, and we would have done a reading, we'd have the whole day. And I have to say, and so it felt too long online to do a whole day, and I'm loving this, you know, and all the stuff we're receiving and listening to you, the conversations are really wonderful. The work coming out is, is you know, really exciting as a first move together. But I do feel, wow, if we'd had a whole day, you know? like to what it means the time and i think that's something that i'm learning from from this event is the 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 beauty of taking the time you know already we thought three hours online can we do it and i think it's it, you know it feels wonderful it feels right it feels nearly too short so um i just want to thank you again i think it's it's just a wonderful space that you're opening up with your willingness as well to be part of it but time talking of time passing it's you know, we're nearly at the end, and actually, it's it's felt just like the beginning. So it's the endless cycle. We'll meet again in the morning. <laughs> is, it, <laughs> is it your turn, Nisha? Or oh no, it's I'm almost almost there. Yes, you will. Well, great. And you can see why the French or this quartet of poets in Paris, why they. They lock themselves down in a room, a basement room for a week, you know, and they were writing sonnets. That's the way they organized their, their link first. So they were writing sonnets in the four languages they were sharing. Um, and then they would have one sonnet in each language. That, that does demand more time than what we have now. But it's wonderful to imagine that seven days, you know, mm. like really digging in. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I think, isn't that how Captain B part the trot mask replica as well? Sorry, go on. Isn't that how Captain Beefheart did his album, Trout oh, yes. Mask Replica? Yeah, I think we mm -hmm. can find a lot of, in fact, that's a great analogy, actually, to go to musicians, because that's what they do. They just lock themselves away, and then, um, you know, not always, but the process can also be exactly that. You just stay away until you, not, perhaps not even done, but that you, you really take that time to, to work communally. I've got one from Amy. Oh, in response to my notes, knows not what she does. She says kno, she says no, she says nichts, knots, nothings, in tonight. Mm. Let me see, how are we doing for time? We've got, if we are wanting to be very strict okay. about it, we have 20, right. 20 minutes to go. Um. I was thinking about how the, um, Something I remembered when I was doing this like little period of research into the the way our relationship to the night and to sleep has changed. And I, maybe this is common knowledge, but it was a real surprise to me at the time, which is that the idea of uninterrupted eight hour sleep, it's like a relatively recent, recent. thing. And that especially in the, it was very common that, that you'd, you'd have, uh, you'd wake up at midnight, for example, and have food and pray and make love mm. and, mm -hmm. And it kind of, I guess, relates to the idea of instant. Now there's now, because there's so much of an onus on product, the productivity of the day, there's this kind of fear of not being able to sleep. It's kind of liberating this idea that you can't, the night can be something you can wake up into and do things. And, mm. 
Yeah. Yeah, that you have different different uh, slices of time for sleep and for activity, you know, in a way. That yeah. it's not just big chunks, but that they could be. Do you know one of the madnesses of our current uh, economic system is people being encouraged to work in different countries or cities? Uh, and quite a few people have found themselves locked down, uh, including myself, yes. uh, in places which are not where they are supposed to be working physically. And personally, mm. I'm managing this by doing split sleeps. You know, am I waking up just before 2 a.m. to clock into my office for 3 to 5 a.m. Uh, and then sleeping again in the afternoon and waking up again for a night shift? Uh, I'm not the only person doing this. There are a lot yes, of people absolutely. crossing time zones at the moment while physically in their confinement. Mm. Uh, they they mm. are in every other way astral. And, and I think that should be a diagnostic for how to move work closer to people's actual dwellings. Mm. I mean, no, nobody should have been caught out in such a way as to find that their web of workplaces doesn't add up with time zones. Yes. Yes. Unless mm. you burn fossil fuels. Mm. Mm. Is it me now? Uh, I think. Oh, hang on. It's. Uh, oh, Will. We yeah, it's funny. We haven't heard Will. But no, I. I sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And downstairs we go, and the tap glows with liquid sounds, and you and I. Mm. Oh, we're moving into song. For some reason, yeah. for some reason, it's yeah. not letting me type. Have I been locked out oh. in some way? Uh, mm, oh, no. yeah, thanks. No, 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 it's working now. Right. I just um, setting it up for Varney to knock, yes, absolutely. knock, it, knock it out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> and then Misha will close us off with a pop, another pop lyric, and then that's it. <laughs> we'll be ready for uh, waking up at the 3 a.m. And, and, yeah. and proceed with our with our new time zone, new time zone work. But I was reading also that book about or able oh, no. to yeah, Sorry, this, yeah. this, this, the same idea with um, with the shifted shifted times of work world that you were talking about. And I can't mm. remember what it is that changed them. Quite apart from the way of working, it had something to do with electric light, didn't it? Um, I yeah. Remember. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that was one of the incentives behind um, yeah. illuminating the night sky to, to, so that people can work lo yeah, longer, exactly. work later, because yeah. mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. had to stop working without, you know, before street, you know, street lights. And yeah. Who's, who's the work is this? This is Varney. Varney. Oh, yeah, sorry. Cry out like sailors, nights empty, all the constellations are here. Again, I'm enjambing with Will's line to, to do productive ambiguity. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Very nice. Okay. Nisha, you are, you are taking a time <laughs> with the last line. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I will read, uh, in the meantime, I will read something from Orchid. She's going back to the eco discourse earlier. Climate change is changing our relationship to sleep at night. That's very much what we've been talking about. Now, higher temperatures are affecting sleep patterns. Higher temperatures are affecting sleep patterns. So. Okay, just waiting for one word. <laughs> That's right. That's great. <laughs> And it is the final one as well, isn't it? So. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, I think I'm there. Okay. Um, poetry as a skin between us, our oceanic bodies passing like junk in the moonlight, like ghosts at the fugitive house party, let's not really leave. <laughs> That's a fantastic endpoint. This points of suspension, even. Yeah. <laughs> excellent. 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 
So, wow. Uh, we've just begun. In fact, that's exactly what you said. Let's not really leave. I suggest <laughs> that we have, we have a little bit of time. Not that much. In fact, we have a few minutes left. But I'm wondering whether, so we want to go back to the beginning. Have a quick look at your lines. Um, I'm thinking that it could be, we, no, we'll keep those as they are, but um, it could be a good idea to see whether we want to meet again to be looking at those refrains or something like that. We do that in a, in a private setting because we can't set up a new um, uh, public event like this, but I wonder whether that might be something to consider because it would be wonderful to see if we manage to make sense of what we have each done as a refrain, you know, like the summary of those of those disparate lines, whether that works or not. Um, so would we read like one stanza each? I think we, oh, that's, yeah, why not? I was thinking we would eat, we would um, blend our voices. Mm. Um, if we read a stanza each, that means that we are starting to make sense of the stanzas, you know, in their own sort of um, reality. You, we could try, if you like. Um, uh, there are five right? stanzas, is that right? Yeah, do you, do you feel like doing that, that One, we each two, read stanzas three, instead of reading each our lines? Because I was thinking we would five. just do a merging of voices. Oh. Um, but I'm very happy to try differently that we just read the five. Yeah. So yeah, I think stanza each would be interesting to hear the integrity of the stanza. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Without the different voices. Yeah. Great. So let's do that. So who would be happy to start? I guess Somebody? we could go we could go in the order that we were writing it. Is in Yeah. Okay. So that means that I open, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. And should we just, should I just continue on after you when you finish? No. Uh, As in after you've read your stanza, yes, you should can, I read? Yeah, you can just read the, the title for it. And, uh, and then, I'm just having a quick conversation here. No, I think we keep the screen sharing for now. Um, and then just to continue, sorry, but just to continue, um, the idea of the idea of daylight savings time also related to work and productivity. So again, you know, m meeting on this reorganization of the night for productivity here, a comment from Davinia uh, regarding the, the idea of daylight savings also in relation to work and productivity. Mm. Again, thank you all. I don't have time to read them now because we are going to be reading all the stanzas, but uh, do keep uh, writing your, um, comments. Oh, Julie is awake at 5.40 a.m. Now, now, excuse me, but that is fantastic because I believe oh. that is, yeah, that would be astronomical twilight moving into um, the nautical. So moving into serious dawn, I think, uh, Julie, I think, I can't remember if you are in Sydney. Okay. Let's start here. Civil twilight. Let's start here. In dark times, is there relief at in-between hours? When Henry Cavill's hands clean and reveals himself to your face and leaves. Through the red arch, six degrees from evening, your head beneath the pillar of night, reflects joined to itself beneath the water. The exposure is never symmetrical, nor at twilight, a cast of your faces backlit by not Hollywood stars. On the other side of La Noche, the civic twilight, pure gold light. Nautical twilight. Tidur and Malam. Familial night like stair light, tidying at the door. My captain, I drift with eyes that never naked net small stars. This shift to lockdowns, dim enlightenment, the safety of connection brought into relief. Lenses, windows, souls, tessellating on screen. A song on a boat. I travel through the night, get nowhere. Donde estoy? What island harbors me? A doorless house, a lightless night, a gate to get to the other side. A gate to get on board, a ghost to push for light. Astronomical twilight. 
what we perceive as sinking is spinning. Light unlike refuge is perpetual. The purple maps are going to work like many others. Impersonal their falling shares in which impersonal we fall, unintelligible who fall in vain, who while away stars. Bluebird comes, he brings news. It'll be over soon. Look, there, he hides by the Juneberry, waits for me to go out into the night. Look at his ruby eyes, how like Earth's insides. Let's get lost. Insides out, find me. Landing in the West End, midnight bus full, backpack on lap like many others. Night. Who is awake? An indeclinable word for a web. Take upa purva ratram, eyeballs the safety net. It's corruptly given. Night finds us differently. I just live among luminous shapes, my shoes, cap, and old telescope. Think I sense something else, blindsided feeling away, just can't be sure, lost footing, but sense. Whether felt uncambered is lyric thinking. No darkness begins under the sun, you say. But long ago I shut my eyes and began the no touch dancing. Astronomical twilight towards dawn. I was born at night in the southern hemisphere, my heart upside down. Now in between nose knots and downstairs we go and the tap glows with liquid sounds and you and I cry out like sailors, nights empty, all the constellations are here. Poetry as a keen skin between us, our oceanic bodies passing like junk in the moonlight, like ghosts at the fugitive house party. Let's not really leave. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo, everybody. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and do you have any thoughts here? Li literally just on the, uh, on the structure, like reading it in stanza. So interesting, I think, because there any comments on that? Well, it made me think, well, especially because we started with the person who started each stanza, so the way that that, then dictated the voice like we were almost working within the grooves that they set yes so it, it felt quite right mm. yes, and yes. it was very it was really i found it really quite moving listening to listening to it all together and all of the little the threads and Absolutely. everything coming in mm. yeah i agree i like the sort of reversal or, or rotation which brings us to john and that i was born at night Mm. So the ending feels like an opening. Yeah. yeah. Let's not really leave as well, literally, just sort of allowing for that as well. Mm. Yeah. I think it just reminds me that it's like, there's, psych there's something very moving about cycles or just staying with something for a long period of time. Mm. Like the way that all these things repeat each other, you know, the day, the year, the month, you know, birth and death, you know, in, in, in miniature and, I think like, I mean, it's impossible to know, but I, I feel like this is so much a poem written in this particular format, in this environment, in the lockdown with everyone on screen. Like, I, I can't imagine what we would have written at the British Library, but <laughs> I think the, it would, like the affect would be yes. not, like, nothing like this. There's so much reaching towards and um, coming up against and, and, and a lot of uh, sort of sort of there's a kind of melancholy tone and a great deal of emptiness and ghosts and haunting. <laughs> I feel, yeah, what would the yeah. best library of I agree, I agree, yeah. And so, so poignant that at least here in Deal literally is, is getting darker and darker and is, is I'm literally, my room here is, is getting really dark and, and it's actually quite moving that oh, we began. I see that, yeah. With, with light and, and it's just you know it's going and um 
yeah mm. I, I love I, I love this kind of um, sequence of um, this poem So I'm inviting people who are still with us on the hashtag Night in Refuge, please continue the um, conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. We are keeping that hashtag open and also we will most likely try and get together this time in private the um, all of us poets that were in this visible room, if you like, uh, to try and see what we might do with our refrains. But I just want to thank everybody um, here first, um, I want to thank um, Nisha Ramaya, Leo Boris, Vani Capildeo, Will Harris. I want to thank Mays Albeck for having been, she is our desk manager. She developed the platform that we've been writing on, which has been faultless, I think, very easy to use. And I hope you as viewers have also been able to enjoy the development of the writing through this sort of, I think, quite flexible, easy platform. I have no idea, I think the notes were used as well, uh, quite a lot by, most people, I didn't, I didn't get to use them. Again, we are putting this entire conversation unedited onto YouTube and Facebook. And we will also be editing some of this conversation and recording the individual poets' lines uh, to be part of the Berlin International Poetry Festival. And that will be part of a video that I'm producing for it on the 9th of June at 9 p.m. So you'll have then the opportunity as well to rehear in a different format, some of the work that we have done here today. So I just want to thank again all our partners, all our supporters, wonderful Counterpoint Arts, Vesopolis, um, Arts Council England for funding uh, and supporting us, Cementfields, our partners that lead us onto the festival in 2021. And again, to the, the, the five of you here, thank you again so, so much. And thank you to everybody out there watching, writing, commenting. Please continue on hashtag night and refuge, and we'll see you again soon. And sleep well. <laughs> thank you. Or don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Do sleep, sleep's underrated. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.